Do you like sex, Mr. Lebowski? Excuse me? Sex, the physical act of love. Coitus. Do you like it? I was talking about my rug. You're not interested in sex? You mean coitus? <laughs> Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film, we explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a voiceover artist, uh, writer, producer, and host over at Collider and on a couple other podcasts uh, here in Los Angeles as well. Yeah. And today we are talking about... A movie that has been requested, I think, pretty much since the beginning of the Cinephiles. Yeah, yeah. In fact, and it was also requested by two of our Patreons, which is oh. Michael Ruggeri and Wiley Todd. Oh, Wiley. Hello, Wiley, Wiley. Who have both requested The Big Lebowski. Yeah. This is a cult classic, one of the most quoted movies of all time. And rather than us describe why we wanted to do it, I would love to hear our patrons. So, uh, Michael and Wiley, why did you guys want us to review The Big Lebowski? Hello, my name is Wiley Todd, and I am from Oklahoma, and the reason I think Big Lebowski is such a good film is the interaction with the trio. You got Jeff Bridges, John Goodman, and Steve Buscemi. You got Jeff Bridges as this monotone person, just laid back a lot. Then you got John Goodman, which is kind of the uptight guy, and then you got the Steve Buscemi that just kind of gets pushed out all the way, and that chemistry makes the movie amazing, and I think the Coen brothers directed it in a way where it feels like they're a real good friendship. That's a great point, Wiley. I 100% agree about that relationship. The Cone brothers handled that perfectly. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Normally, I always ask you how you came to the film. Yeah. But I would like to talk about something else first. Sure. Which is this movie. I'm not even sure if you know this. Okay. But this movie is key to our friendship. Really? Yes, it is. Wow. So so we've talked about on the show several times that sometimes we roll with this huge group of people. Yeah, yeah we do. In fact, last night we rolled with like 115 people into our good friend Kay Cannon's movie, mm -hmm. Blockers, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. In theaters now, go see it. Yes. It is awesome. But the origins of our this huge group of friends right. goes back to, in my opinion, the meeting between your group of friends from Florida State oh, yeah. and my group of friends from USC Film School and from up in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And that fateful meeting, the very first one, happened at the Hollywood Star Lanes, the location for The Big Lebowski. Oh, how funny. Yeah. That is where... Oh, yeah. And I don't think you were in LA yet. No. Yeah, that's where Karen and I and a couple of other friends met, yeah. met cinephiles guests Michael Ross and Michael Vogel, along with uh, Sarah Cowperthwaite, right. at the Hollywood Star Lanes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And the very, or the beginnings mm. of this friendship was we went bowling there all the time. Mm -hmm. And that place has since been torn down, which yeah. is really sad. And I, my, I think there's a really strong possibility that if the Big Lebowski hadn't happened, we would not have gone there. Really? Well, I mean, I think I think that that became a cool place to go. Oh, after the Big Lebowski. Yeah, I remember that when I first moved out of here. The guys, right, because they all came ahead like six months ahead of me, uh, and they laid the groundwork for for a lot of us who came after them. And I remember that the, one of the first things they would do was take us all around to the sites that were in other movies. Like we go to Mitch and right. Mitch and Mickey's. Is Mitch that what? It, yeah. Is that what it is over at uh, uh, over there? The swingers, people who were doing their yeah, stuff. Yeah, at the Dresden. At the Dresden, right? Yeah. We go there. We go. We'd go to the Hollywood. I remember. I remember a few times the Hollywood Starlands after that, and and the number of areas, a number of places all around, obviously, to get the idea of seeing these films and seeing these things occur in these interesting places in Los Angeles. So, yeah, that makes sense. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. So now I will ask you the traditional question <laughs> of, do you remember how you first came to The Big Lebowski? What year is this movie? 1998. This is the 20th anniversary. That okay. is one of the reasons we are doing it right That's now. That's right. Well, then I would have to say I was probably... No! Yes! I remember this distinctly. I saw the movie just before uh, we went to London. I remember that. Mm. And I was a little on the fence about it. I was like, oh, it's okay. It's didn't like get in me the way I thought it would and then I went to London and I had this really and this is an interesting story Steve I had this 
relationship with this woman that I met in a Shakespeare chat room. Her name was Gudrun. As you- <laughs> yeah, her name was Gwyn- She actually said her name was Gwyneth because we had a Shakespearean love thing going on, and she was Paltrow, and I was the Joseph Fiennes uh, part. And we would just get we fell in love over the Shakespeare chat room. I flew to London to study, but then I flew to Vienna to see her for ten days during our break. And during that ten day break in '98 is where she took me to see Lebowski because Lebowski apparently was like the rage of Austria. Like it was the right. thing to see. And I remember going to see it with her at some, it was either at a film festival or at a, at a, at a theater that was kind of in an alley. And so they had this huge like project, a screen set up in an alley. You, it was open air theater. You'd get beer and sit down and watch the movie. And that's when I learned to appreciate The Big Lebowski. So I will say I saw The Big Lebowski before then, but I didn't really see The Big Lebowski until I saw it with her and had an incredible discussion about the film afterwards. So... So, so it's, my story is very similar, not oh. with the German uh, <laughs> Shakespeare and Austrian, 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 yeah. Austrian Shakespeare yeah, yeah. Alley beer garden thing, yeah. but in terms of seeing it and not quite being into it the first time, is that I I was a Coen Brothers fan from Raising Arizona sure. and all this stuff, and then the movie previous to Lebowski is Fargo, yeah. which I loved, and it was a fantastic movie. It's nominated for Best Picture, and while Fargo still has that kind of quirky Coen Brothers sensibility, mm-hmm. it's a heavier movie yes. than Lebowski and and I just was like wow this is who the Cone brothers are so when Lebowski came out I was super excited I went to see it uh with, in North Hollywood with my friend Matt Garcia and with Karen mm-hmm. and I walked out and went eh, that was okay yeah you know I had sort of a and it was so not what Fargo was I think right that I just didn't Appreciate it. And then, uh, as you and I both did, I had the DVD quality control job yeah. right in the late 90s. And one of the first movies I DVDs I worked on was The Big Lebowski. Mm-hmm. And I watched it over and over <laughs> and over again. And this, and I think I mentioned this when we talked about Rushmore, mm-hmm. is one of the movies that every time I watched it, it got better and better. And, it, and, it, and what's funny is that seems to mirror the experience of the critical world who kind of yeah. gave it a whatever when it yes. came out. And, and, and the world in general is like, this is not a movie that like you it's it's not that you don't get it mm-hmm. but i don't i think it takes it a few times to appreciate mm-hmm. and now when i'm watching it i don't understand what i didn't see because and this is what by the way makes me a little nervous about this podcast is that i think this might be one of the most quotable movies we've had maybe since monty python and the holy grail sure where almost every scene the lines are amazing yeah. and i'm going to be really tempted to be just saying isn't this great? You remember when he said this? And you remember when he said this? And I'm, by the way, I'm not a great movie quoter. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not my skill set. And then when I go to edit it, I'm going to want to put in every... <laughs> and so what I'll say instead is like, you know what? Watch the movie. Yeah, <laughs> Because every moment, whatever quotes and things we find to talk about or to put in the edit, yeah. there's so much more. And, and this is a great point you bring up, Steve, about having to see a movie more than once. I was having a discussion with a couple of younger people who run a YouTube channel. They, they review films, whatever, and they took umbrage with my uh, uh, statement that I made uh, on Collider one uh, recently where I said, like, some movies you have to watch more than once to get them. And they were like, no, you shouldn't have to watch a movie more than once. You should get it the first time you get it. And I go, no, that's just not true. I think when you're young, you can feel that way. But when you get older, you understand that sometimes there are certain things that don't speak to you at a certain time in your life that because of life experience, all of a sudden the movie clicks for you and speaks to you. The movie didn't get better. You got you came to the movie in a different place and you were able to appreciate. And I think Lebowski is like that. If At first it's a little weird and overwhelming and then you understand what the film is actually going for and what it's trying to do and what it's trying to say and then all of a sudden the doors open and click. Everything clicks and you can walk through the door and really appreciate the room that you're in and understand the film. I, I, I think there's so much to what you said and that, that like are, there are certain movies that you see them the first time and that was what it was. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you, and you see it again and you have kind of the same experiences the first mm-hmm. time and that was what it was and that's okay. And there's other movies, I think there are two things going on. One is that, as you always say, you come to things at different times in your life yeah. and you see a movie about, you know, parents and kids and when you saw it when you were 14, you were the kid. And then when you saw it when you're 40, you're now feeling like the parent and the whole experience of watching the movie is different. That definitely happens. Yeah. And then I also think that there's a certain... Certain movies that take a certain level of audience sophistication is that you just, you know, if I showed a French New Wave film to yeah. Jax, 
he would be like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, or Italian what, neorealism. What's 400 blows about? What are you talking <laughs> like, about? Like, why am I, why, where are their cartoons? Like, why <laughs> yeah, is right. this not happening? Right. Is that, and then as you grow older, like sometimes you need the, someone to take you through and explain the significance of this thing. Yep. And then once you've learned that, you know, like if you eat a, a Big Mac, mm -hmm. you appreciate what the Big Mac was when you ate it. There's not sure. like nuance or subtlety <laughs> that you need to gain some sophistication to understand it. Sure. But if you go to a fine meal and maybe the meal is telling you a narrative about where the food came from and the history of a certain region and stuff like that, well, that takes some mm -hmm. appreciation to get into. And the same is definitely true with movies. And I think The Big Lebowski is like a fine meal. Yeah. And that's why we started the cinephiles. <laughs> Absolutely. To help people appreciate the fine meals that are these movies. Well, and also so you and I can re-enjoy these wonderful yes. meals every week. <laughs> Absolutely. On a regimented basis. <laughs> Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, pre-production. Okay. Um, obviously, this is the Coen Brothers. We went into a lot of detail about their origin story when we did No Country for Old Men. Um, so, and I really like that episode. I recent I listened to it again recently. Oh, and cool. I, I'm really I think that was a really good one. So, if you want to learn more about the Coen Brothers, go check that out. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't know about them is that they sit down and write their scripts together, and when they hit a snag, which all writers do, where you go, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. They just leave the script. And they go, and that's exactly the opposite advice of what most writing instructors will tell you. It's like, like Stephen King in his amazing book on writing says, if you walk away from the script, it's going to die, or from the book, it's going to die. Wow. So you have to, you have to keep at it. And they just go, oh, we're stuck, and they go away and they do another script. And when we get that stuck on that, they go back to another one. And so they're always hmm. doing them in rotation. And I actually, this is actually more how I do stuff. Okay, it's more the multitasker brain. Like I don't know what to do here. Right. I'll do something else. And so they wrote this at the same time they were writing Barton Fink. Oof. Yeah. Which is not a Coen Brothers movie I revisit. That's a, one of my least favorite Coen Brothers yeah. movies. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too, actually. So they're right, and they're totally different, you know, mm -hmm. stylistically. They're writing them at the same time. They finally finish it around the time they finish Bart are, are making Barton Fink. Yeah. And they go, but but they had written it for Jeff Bridges and John Goodman, and those guys aren't available. So yeah. that kind of goes in a drawer. And then they make this after they make um Fargo. Um, and Lebowski, by the way, is based on two people, but the main one seems to be this guy, Jeff Dowd, mm -hmm. who is a real guy <laughs> living in Los Angeles who had like a political hippie past, yeah. who's kind of a stoner. And, uh, and there's another guy, it's also kind of based on the, uh, Peter Xline, who is like a film guy. Um, and they just decided, wouldn't it be funny to put this guy into essentially a Raymond Chandler you know, Dashiell yeah. Hammett movie. Yeah. Because the structure of Lebowski, which is what's so bizarre, is like the Maltese Falcon or the Big Sleep. Yeah. That is basically. what it is. It is basically the same structure. Absolutely. Except that instead of a hard-boiled detective, you have this stoner bowler. You have the dude. Yeah, you have the dude. And um, and it's funny because, of course, they did write it for Jeff Bridges. Mm -hmm. And there, there can't be Lebowski without Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Like, I mean. Absolutely agreed. It is just, he is so... Lebowski is and and really they wrote uh Donnie for Steve Buscemi they wrote mm -hmm. The Stranger for Sam Elliott like they, they and they they really are these directors who have always seen these things in these actors yeah um and uh the cinematographer who's of course someone we've talked about a bunch at this point is Roger Deakins yeah who finally won an Oscar who finally deservedly won an Oscar <laughs> I mean that movie yeah, that's among the most beautifully filmed. That's uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, one of the most beautifully filmed movies I've ever seen in my life. Yep, I mean Roger Deakins, and this is his uh, fourth movie with them. Wow. And the reason that I didn't know this, the reason that Roger Deakins first worked with them, and the, his first one was Barton Fink, mm -hmm. was they had just, they were doing a movie non union, and they needed a really good DP who's non union. And Deakins is from the UK, so he was an established DP, but he wasn't in the union in the US. Oh. And so they could bring him in for his first movie to do Barton Fink, huh. and they've worked with him ever since. Yeah, yeah, Smart. Um, yeah. I mean, this is—he's an unbelievable cinematographer. Um, and uh, that's all I got for some pre-production. <laughs> oh, except for one thing, which yeah. is the—is <clears throat> that they co-direct films, and and from what I have heard, they don't argue on the set. Oh, which has got to be really even for brothers yeah, yeah. to like be on the set because there's so many things where it's like, should the head be you know, tilted 20 degrees to the right or straight right. up and down. And the fact to agree on all of these things or should we use the blue shoes or the red shoes is, right. but apparently they do. And what they say is they get all their fights out when they're writing a script. Makes sense. Yeah. So they're on the same page yeah. when they get going to, to make the move. That makes sense. All right. Should we enter the world let's, of the Big Lebowski? Let's do it. <laughs> we begin uh, with the song Tumbling Tumbleweeds. <laughs> 
them tumbling down. And the narration of Sam Elliott. Way out west there was this fella, fella I want to tell you about. Fella by the name of Jeff Lebowski. At least that was the handle his loving parents gave him. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing. I, it's just so bizarre. Yeah. As a voiceover artist, man, that guy's voice is uh, on, an, like, it's just in a pantheon of oh, yeah. Hall of Fame voices. And he just puts you in the mood. And it's funny what you say, because the Dashiell Hammett thing is there, but the beginning, which would normally it's be. Yeah, it's a Western. And it would normally be that like, you'd hear the Humphrey Bogart voice, you know, like. I don't know if it's the City of Angels, it's not the City of but you hear it through a different voice that's right. got this kind of laid back southern sound, it then all of a sudden it becomes a, a western vibe, yeah. Well, and this is what's so weird about this movie is I can't I can't analyze this. I don't understand Lebowski. I don't know why <laughs> really? it works. No, okay. I, I mean because it's like, okay, we're in third person voiceover yeah. of a character that has nothing whatsoever to do, but it's a real character. It's yeah, not it's, just narration. It is the story. has nothing particular to do with the story. Mm -hmm. We don't know how this third person discovered the story of the dude right. <laughs> while he's talking. And then he kind of rambles in this way as yeah. he gets not tongue-tied exactly, but he's talking about... Sometimes there's a man, I won't say a hero, because what's a hero? But sometimes there's a man... And I'm talking about the dude here. Sometimes there's a man, well, he's the man for his time and place. He fits right in there. And that's the dude in Los Angeles. It's this weird, rambling, yeah. odd thing. And, and, and by the way, one of the other interesting things I find about this movie is that it's a period piece. Because yep. it's made in 98, but it's about 91. Right. That's a very strange thing to do a seven-year-old period piece. <laughs> you know, like yeah. why? Why do you have any thought of why they chose to do that? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't. It's a good question. I don't know. I mean, because they talk about Saddam and the Iraqis right, right off the bat, and put it in that time. Maybe because it was before the advent of technology, like mobile phones and all those kind yeah, of things. So maybe that's setting a, maybe it that's back, why. you know, setting it back just a little bit before all of that starts to happen makes sense for everything that's going to happen in the movie. Um, I would imagine. That's what yeah. it seems like to me. It's such an odd choice, but we hear about it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right at the beginning. And as we're hearing the description of the dude, yeah. we see the dude. Yes. For the first time in the grocery store, in the flip-flops, in the shorts, walking down the dairy aisle. Great sweater, by the way. <laughs> it's really... Uh, apparently, a lot of that is Jeff Bridges' clothes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting. The whole beginning, with the half and half and everything, it just... It oh, just, my God. Just brilliant. Just yeah. Brilliant. Well, and it's like he looks at the half and half. He mm -hmm. smells the half and half, and then we cut to him ch in the checkout line with just a little bit of half and half in that mustache. <laughs> I always find it weird because to me, Steve, I'm always looking for symbolism in films, right? And half and half makes sense because he's half and half the whole movie, half in, half out. The whole movie, he's half in, half out of whatever's happening. And so, and, and then when he writes the check for this, it's sixty nine. That's a sexual term. Yeah. So there's a lot here for me that like I look at this and I'm like, what do these means? What does it? What do these things mean? That kind of stuff. So I really enjoy explaining. It could be nothing and just ca it could just be happenstance, but I like it. Two things. The first <laughs> is you just reminded me that I actually wanted to have Caucasians for us this morning, <laughs> and I forgot to <laughs> I forgot to gun. prepare them. Oh. Um, well. The second thing is I actually think this movie is filled with. Tons of symbolism yeah. in search of a meaning. Yes, in you know search what I mean? of a meaning. Like yes. they're throwing out all these things that, like, this, what does that mean? Right. And the reality is, it probably means nothing. <laughs> you exactly. know, it doesn't mean anything. We go back to the dude's apartment, and uh, immediately he is grabbed by some guys. Yeah. Dragged forward, thrown his head first into the toilet. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is going on in this movie? The movie starts really fast. It's a surprisingly fast movie, too, Steve. It Watching is. it for this. I'm always unsure whether I should watch it again. And then when I watch it, I realize how fast the movie is. It really goes from place to place. Yeah. There's not a lot of downtime in this movie. A lot of shit is happening all the time. Yeah. And most of which you don't really understand yeah. what the hell's going on. And neither does the dude, yeah. yeah. And, and they're asking, where's the money, Lebowski? And right. Bunny says you're good for it. And I love the very first line we get from the dude is he finally comes out of the toilet. <laughs> and he says, it's down there somewhere. Let me take another look. <laughs> And then fishing his glasses out of oh, the yeah. toilet and Classic. putting them on. Yeah. I mean, we immediately know that this is going to be a completely different kind of guy. We hear that 
the someone the money's owed to Jackie Treehorn, whoever yeah. that is, and and then this guy goes and pees on the rug. Yeah, not the rug, man. Not the rug, man. <laughs> And then we find out that no one calls him Lebowski. I'm the dude. Right. <laughs> and he very clearly says, does this place look like I'm fucking married? The toilet seat's up. <laughs> <laughs> right. And these two idiots are like, oh, wait, weren't we supposed to find a millionaire? Wasn't yeah. this guy supposed to be a millionaire? Blah, blah, blah. And then they get mad at Lebowski right. for them being stupid. Right. Which is hilarious. And they find, I, also love, I love they find the bowling ball. What the fuck is this? Obviously, you're not a golfer. <laughs> and this is the thing about this movie, and I don't know how we're going to do it because every line's funny. Yeah, every, it is. I mean, there's so many just little rhythmically funny, like yeah. the word choice is funny. They're just, you know, reaction shots are funny. Steve Buscemi in the background is consistently funny. Oh yeah, absolutely. You could you could literally just watch Steve Buscemi through the whole movie. Sure, and it is hilarious. Well, the deception here too about and these two opening lines are great, Steve, because. The dude is not as dumb or as as uh, incapable as you initially think him. Because of his sarcastic lines, that lets you know that he's capable of handling whatever situation he's in, just in his own way, right? Because he his, it's defiant. The golfer joke is defiant. The let me look back and let me look again into yeah. the toilet bowl. That's defiant. He has a little bit of edge to him that a lot of people don't give him enough credit for because they think he's just a stoner dude wandering through the world. He's got some stu- He's got some brains here. He, he 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 works at his own. His brains work at their own pace. Yes, they're not, but but they are definitely working. Yeah, you know, he, no, he's not a dumb guy. No, nope. he's not a cowardly guy. No, he, but he is. He's the dude. Yeah, he's the dude. He's the right man for his time and <laughs> place. Right. The dude abides. The dude abides. <laughs> um, and then and then our last shot of Lebowski is our guys leave. Is it's just a fantastic shot of him sitting on that toilet, drenched with toilet water, with his sunglasses on. <laughs> It's fantastic. And we cut to the Hollywood Star Lanes. And our opening credit sequences to uh, The Man in Me, Bob Dylan. Great song. Yeah. A fantastic soundtrack. I mean, the whole soundtrack. And this is the the real Hollywood term would be music supervised yep. by T-Bone Burnett. Yep. Uh, the great, brilliant T-Bone Burnett. Yes. And he didn't like the name music supervisor because he felt like, I didn't supervise Bob Dylan. Right. That's not correct. Right. So he took the title of music archivist. <laughs> um and the next movie he did with uh, the Coen brothers is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Which is, which is phenomenal. Yeah, amazing. I mean, yeah. T-Bone Burnett is like, yeah. he's the man. And Carter Burwell does the score. So yeah, and the great. score is great. And they work really well together. Yep. And we're in the credit sequence at the bowling alley, and every shot is amazing. Yeah. And all the bowlers that are there just that are just fantastic characters. The slow mo, the guts, the the gut that the, these guys yeah. have, the the professional way, the towel, everything about it is just brilliant. All the little done. affectations yeah. and stuff, and it's like it's every one of those people becomes a complete character yep. in one shot yep. in our opening montage, which it's is great casting by fantastic. the Coen Brothers. And who do we end on? We end on Steve Buscemi. Yeah. Woo! I'm throwing rocks tonight. Mark it, dude. It seems like is Donnie the best bowler bowler of this team? I think Donnie's absolutely the best bowler of this team, and also the best person on that team. Oh, without question, right? He's a really nice guy. He's a nice guy. How did he? I always wonder how he ended up with those two dudes. Like, I just would love to see the the prequel of this. If you could ever go back in time and find out how Donnie even found his way to be a member of this bowling team with the dude and uh, Walter Subcheck. Well, and one of the things that the Coen brothers talk about with Steve Buscemi is that. In the previous, like in Fargo, yeah. the last movie they did yeah. with Buscemi, he talks a mile a minute. And and most of That's the right time, yeah. we've seen Steve Buscemi, whether it's Reservoir Dogs or wherever, he is a talker, fast talker. Yep. And so they said, won't it be fun to give Tawny Buscemi the fewest lines in the movie and have him be a listener? Yeah. And, and I just, what I love about that is that the Cone brought most, in Hollywood, most of the time, people see actors as what they've done. Yep. And they go, oh, you do this. You do the fast talking thing. Right. And the Cone brothers see actors as what they could be. Right. And you look at how they cast John Goodman over the years. They look yeah. at Jeff Bridges in this movie. They just go, I think you can do that. Yeah. And even Torturo in so many Torturo, different Torturo. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Well, and we're going to get to some yep. Torturo yep. when we get to the Jesus <laughs> fan. Um, and, and, and we have, well, we see Buscemi and then we see the, the dude and Walter, John Goodman are talking about the rug. Yeah, man. It really tied the room together. So this was a valued. Uh, yeah. Tied the room together, dude? My rug. Were you listening to the dude's story, Donnie? Walter. Were you listening to the dude's story? I was bowling. 
So you have no frame of reference here, Donnie. You're like a child who wanders into Walter, the middle of a movie and wants what, to know. Walter, what's the point, man? There's no reason. Here's my point, dude. There's no fucking reason why these. Yeah, two... Walter, what's your point? Huh? Walter, what is the point? Look, we all know who is at fault here. What the fuck are you talking about? Huh? No, what the fuck are you? I'm not. We're talking about unchecked aggression here. What the dude. fuck is he talking my about? My rug. Forget look, it, Donnie. You're out of your element. Man, I love John Goodman. This feels very mammoth esque. Totally. In, in the rhythm. The, the rhythm, yes. Absolutely. And the cutting each other off and the going back to the same thing over and over again. You're out of your element, Donnie. You're out of your element. You know, all this kind of and, stuff. Yeah, the and repetition the, yeah. and the staccato rhythm of the dialogue. Yeah, and then totally. it ends with a button where John Goodman says, it, the, it, the rug tied the room together, dude. The rug really tied the room together. You know, that I mean, whole it, back it, and forth. And John Goodman has said this is, you know, one of his favorite characters he's ever played. Why wouldn't it be? I mean, it's so good. And yeah. do you know what the inspiration for one of the inspirations for Walter is no it is a person we have talked about several times on the cinephiles who's that when I say it it will make perfect sense to you John Milius oh well yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely I can see that especially after seeing the documentary with him oh my god yeah absolutely the, John Milius the gun toting yeah, the conservative gun. <laughs> ultra macho <laughs> Makes sense. I know, right? Surrounded by the hippies. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And, and, and what we hear is, you know, that Walter is going off on this thing. Yeah. You know, the unchecked aggression. Um, and, and, and the continual, and I can't do them all, but the continual repetition of forget it, Donnie. You're out of your element, Donnie. Yeah. Shut the fuck up, Donnie. Yeah. These are going to happen throughout the whole film. Right. And man, they're funny. And unchecked aggression is a theme through the whole movie, which starts off right at the beginning when he's citing that check. He's watching George Bush say this yeah. unchecked aggression this against will Kuwait. Not will not stand. Yeah. It plays out through the whole movie. Yeah, well, anyway. that's why I go like, it's kind of symbolism without a meaning. Yes. Because like we're repeating these things. I don't know exactly what we're saying about them, <laughs> but we're definitely, I mean, you know that Walter was home watching that speech from George Bush and Probably. that's how this got into his vocabulary. Yeah. Also, dude, Chinaman is not the preferred nomenclature. Asian American, please. <laughs> and I love that turn in his character. It's so funny. And I'm going to bring it up later, yeah. this thing. So I wanted to mention yeah. it now. Yes, go ahead. But the turn happens again at the end because he says... The Chinaman at the end, yeah, yeah, uses that. it. So that's let you that lets you know that Walter is a walking. What do you? Uh, I don't know what do you call it. Walking contradiction. Like contradiction. A, yeah. Walking contradiction. He's constantly trying to correct everybody and say what they're doing right, but then he does all the things wrong as well himself. So it's in it's an incredibly frustrating character to watch. Well, Walter is a he's a lot. He's a lot of a lot. Well, and what and what um, the Coen Brothers described is they kind of went. The dude and Walter are a dysfunctional marriage. Yeah, definitely. They they, they can't do without each other for yeah. some reason. They drive each other completely insane. Yeah. Um, and we see that beginning of that relationship here. But then Walter brings up a really important point, which is that wait a minute, it's the real about it's the it's mm. the, the quote unquote big Lebowski, the rich Lebowski. Yeah. That's the guy that should pay for your rug. Yeah. And I love the moment. The dude's line is that's fucking interesting, man. That's fucking interesting. But he's doing it while Jeff Bridges is doing this weird stretch, yeah, yeah. and I don't know why I find it so funny. It's 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 stoner Tai Chi. That's all yeah. I think it is to get ready to bowl. He's just getting himself mentally centered at, so he can bowl. Like that's the thing. The whole movie he meditates about bowling. Oh yeah. So to so when he's doing this thing that he's doing to me, he's doing it essentially stoner Tai Chi, so he can get into the right frame of mind to bowl a good uh, to throw a strike or something. Well, and something which I'm sure you know, but yeah. but we'll have to talk about throughout the film is that Lebowski, the dude, is modeled. There's, I think there's even a book of Zen Buddhism based on the dude. Oh sure. That he Why is wouldn't it be as like a Zen icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the and 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 bowling for him is like doing meditation mm -hmm. and Tai Chi or whatever. It's a it's a spiritual practice. Exactly. And he is a person who is entirely a live in the moment. Don't think about the future. He, there's some. He's like this is what a Zen master looks like. Yeah. Is the dude. Um, and we end the film. We end the moment with like, yeah, let's go find the real, the, the rich Lebowski. And again, that rug really tied the room together. <laughs> so let's go visit Lebowski. Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman. This is a study. As you can see, the various commendations, awards, Jeffrey citations, Lebowski. honorary degrees, mm. etc. Mm, very impressive. Oh, please feel free to inspect them. Mm. Oh, no, I'm not uh, really... Uh... Oh, please, please. That is the key to the city of Pasadena. This is our second film we've talked about with him. Yeah. The first being Boogie Nights. 
I think I saw this first. I don't think oh, I saw okay. Boogie Nights in the theater. Okay. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I should really go back and listen to our Boogie Nights podcast, and then I would find out when I first came to the sure. film, but I don't really remember. Um, uh, this is where I discovered Philip Seymour Hoffman, okay. this movie. He is amazing yeah. in every word, and he's so odd yeah. and awesome. And so nice. It's such a <laughs> rare role that you ever see him play a character that's this nice and this kind of overwhelmed by the situation. Which yeah. is really funny because he becomes such a more powerful character as this film, as the his film career goes along. Yeah, I mean, compare this character that he's playing to the villain in Mission Impossible Three. It's almost incredible to see the the difference in the transition and the confidence as an actor. Well, and he's doing so, it's like he's playing several things at the same time. Yeah, where it's like he's being really polite and yeah. really nice, and he's feeling very awkward and comfortable. Yeah, and he's genuinely emotional about things, and you see all of this and trying to be exactly proper. Yeah, all at the same time, and and he has his own ideas about things oh yeah and every once in a while you get a quick window into his own depravity and then it slows and then it closes real quick but which we'll get to but i love this whole beginning because he's trying to like be really prideful of lebowski and he's right. talking about all these things in the key to the city and the first lady of the nation and all right. this kind of stuff but like I think he hates the job that he has, <laughs> but he's just tries to make the best of it. You know? well, yeah, he's trying to be the world's greatest assistant. Yeah, and take and take his boss's side. Yeah, even when his boss is, you know, he must come from a terrible home life. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because I go like, well, between Boogie Nights and this, Boogie Nights is ninety seven. This is ninety eight. Yeah. You go, oh, that's a star. Yes. This is a genius here. Yeah. We have to do more stuff with him. Mm -hmm. Um, and we we do find out that uh, Lebowski is disabled, and we also find out that there's these little Lebowski urban achievers, which is some charitable organization. Which, and, and by the way, this movie does have a plot. The plot is really complicated. Yeah. I don't think the plot is actually, strangely enough, that important. Right. But we will go into what it is, and the little urban little Lebowski urban achievers are important to the yes. plot. And there's there's this great moment, by the way, and it's so totally small, but where Philip Seymour Hoffman has a repetition of that happens right back to back and it's so perfect the way he says it he says they're the little lebowski urban achievers inner city children of promise but without the necessary means for a necessary means for a higher education and i wonder if it was in the script my guess is that it was mm -hmm. and it's so it's a perfect example of the odd funniness of this movie yeah why does this repetition have we don't know it's yeah. just a strange way of talking I mean, he's been he's been probably telling this story over and over again his entire life the wrote the by rote Right. And so the rep repetition is interesting. Um, and uh, in comes the Big Lebowski. Yeah. Uh, David Huddleston. Oh. Great. Another great performance. Yes. In his wheelchair. And by the way, this, I totally agree with this dialogue is definitely mammoth. Because mm -hmm. he has the, I know what happened. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Those repetitions are totally mammoth esque. Yes. I know what happened. Yes. Yes. Oh, so you know that they were trying to piss on your rug. Did I urinate on your rug? You mean, did you personally come and pee on my rug? Hello, do you speak English, sir? Parla usted inglés? <laughs> and he's going, what's, what's this to me? Did I micturate on your rug? Micturate is, I just love the, so let me see if I've got this straight. Anytime a rug is uh, micturated on, uh, I'm to blame in this, in Los Angeles, I'm to blame. It's just really obtuse in the way he's approaching it. And I wonder, I'll ask you right now, as we go along through the whole thing, and maybe by the end you can give me an answer, like, do you think... This whole thing he was in on. The 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 rug peeing? Yeah, the rug that he peeing. He helped ev find Lebowski. Ev everything that was mm. done was done. He knew he is not as out of the situation as he conveys himself to be. Well, how would to he have, it never occurred to me until you asked this yeah. question. How would he have done that? Because those two guys came from Jackie Treehorn. Right. No, so but I mean, is he setting up Jeff Lebowski? Like, did he purposely have hit the Lebowski address given to those two guys? Because how do they find, like, all those kinds of things? I just wonder how much of this he's a more active participant in than we think. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Because the, the thought that this is the thought that occurs to me. Yeah. And I don't think this is in the film, but I'm going to say it anyway. It seems to me the only way that he could get the wrong address to the Je Jackie Treehorn people mm -hmm. would be through Bunny. Right. What if Bunny is in on it? I don't know, you give him too much credit. Okay. All right. <laughs> Not Bunny. I'm going to keep thinking about this. Not Bunny, but certainly okay. Lebowski. Anyway, uh, yeah. And one of the other things that's happening in this scene that's fascinating and has importance later on yeah. is this guy is ripping into the dude mm -hmm. for being a lazy person, and he's the great rich man who's right. worked really hard. Right. That ends up not being true. No. Um, and, and then, of course, he keeps calling Lebowski Lebowski. Yeah. Wait, wait let, me, let me explain something to you. Um, 
I am not Mr. Lebowski. You're Mr. Lebowski. I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. <laughs> this is one of my favorite lines of all time. Yep. Um, and, and, and we end with uh, the dude saying, your wife owes me the money for the rug. And the big Lebowski loses it. Yeah. My wife is not the issue here. And as he starts to really go off on the dude, the dude puts on his sunglasses. Yep. Because <laughs> he's not going to be in on that. Nope. He's um, done. And, and, and then this is, and by the way, this is why I brought up this uh, racial epithet of Chinaman because, and this is a weird thing that they do twice in this movie, mm -hmm. which is as Lebowski is going off, he says, I didn't blame anyone for the loss of my legs. Some Chinaman took them from me in Korea, but I went out and achieved anyway. He uses the same weird thing that we heard them talking about in the bowling alley. Right. And that makes it strangely funny because you hear this weird word twice in yeah. these two completely different... And I don't... That's like advanced level Jedi uh, of comedy of planting a weird word yeah. that you notice and then bringing it back in a completely non-funny circumstance mm -hmm. that makes you think about how you heard it before and therefore that makes this line odd and funny. Mm -hmm. And he does it later on uh, and we'll get to that one too, okay. uh, the exact same technique. And and finally Lebowski goes, or the dude says, well, fuck it. Mm -hmm. um, and he leaves while uh, the big Lebowski is yelling, get a job, sir, at him. Right. But... What does he do in the next scene? He, he once again, this is his defiant nature of Lebowski. He tells the Philip Seymour Hoffman character, uh, "Yeah, it went well." Uh, he said, "I could take any rug in a house." Yep. This again, this is a he's not as unprepared as people <laughs> think he is, and gets that rug, and you see him walking out with that with the rug on his shoulder, or the who's carrying it? I think so, and somebody's carrying it for yeah. them, right? And they're walking out with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Yeah. And who do they run into? Bunny. Bunny. Man, Tara Reid was. Hot back then, bud. Tara sure. Reid was hot. Sure. She was cute and hot. And I remember. Working on her toenails, which is an important plant for yes. later on. Yes. And asks him to blow on them. <laughs> but here, this whole sequence, right? She says to blow on him. He's, of course, and this is the dude's kind of confidence. The dude immediately wants to flirt with her, walks over, stroking his beard. Sure. He's got this whole thing and he's, he's like making his moves on her, which is interesting because this is not a good looking dude in this present state, right? No. It, this is a, a woman with money and with a guy like this and all this kind of jazz. And she says to blow and he's sitting there and she then changes the conversation when he doesn't blow. And then we see uh, uh, Peter Stormari. We get the first hint of Peter Stormari out in the water there with the empty bottle of Jack Daniels. Yep. We hear that he's a nihilist from Bunny. Yes. Uh, and then he like takes her foot. Then she says she doesn't blow it. And then she says, I'll suck your cock for $1,000. And Philip Seymour Hoffman starts uncomfortably <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Wonderful woman. We're all... We're all very fond of her, very free-spirited. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then she says... Brian can't watch, though, or he has to pay 100 The fact that she has rates for him watching lets me know that he's done it before. That that what? Who's done That he's that watched Brant before? That has watched her suck someone's cock before. Wow. There we go. And that's what I'm just saying. These are little windows that you get into these people's lives. That To be in this sphere, you have to have a little depravity yourself to be around people who are depraved. You have to have a little bit. Well, and th but there's also this thing of like, how serious is each person in this situation taking what's happening right now? I don't know. Like when, when, when the dude goes over, and I agree with you, to kind of flirt with her. Yeah. I don't think he's flirting with intent. No, no, no. Do you no, know no. what I mean? Like, I think she's it, beautiful and he wants to, like. Well, you know. and she's flirting with him. So, yes. she, so he's kind of going, well, sure, I'll, I, I will continue to have this yeah, discussion absolutely. with you. And then I love just as he's leaving, he's like, I'm just going to go find an ATM. Yeah. You know? Yeah, a money machine. Like, yeah, cash yeah. machine. A cash you machine, know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a. Uh, yeah. yeah. But he asks her him out as soon as she says it's on Yeah, he's like, okay. Let, let, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Um, uh, we're back to bowling. And Walter's brought a dog. Pomeranian. A Pomeranian. A show dog. A show dog. Fucking dog has papers. <laughs> and this goes to, by the way, this is just always on the on the kind of screenwriting filmmaking tip. Is yeah. You, if your scene isn't quite interesting enough, just add another element. Sure. So you add a, a, a weird dog to the middle of the scene. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it adds all this energy to the scene because now we have to deal with the dog. Makes Donnie um, further out of his element. Yeah. Right? And, and, and of course, what happens next is Smokey goes over the line. Over the line! Huh? I'm sorry, Smokey. You were over the line. That's a foul. Bullshit. Market eight, dude. Uh, excuse me. Market zero. Next frame. 
Walter's such an asshole. Horrible. He, he shows up 20 minutes late yep. with a fucking dog. Yeah. And the first thing he does, one of the first things he does is yell at Smokey for being over the line. Uh, an unassuming, chill dude. Completely mellow guy. Right. And, uh, and of course, we never get to know if he was over the line. Yeah, we don't see. We don't know if he was right. over the line. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Right. And by the way, I'm not going to name names, but I certainly have been with this person. <laughs> Uh, Which one, Smokey or the ultra competitive Walter? Walter. Okay. I've been there. There, there is a particular person in my life that I'm thinking of. Okay. You don't know them. Okay. Who would do exactly this thing, wow. and it is awful. Wow. You know, just terrible. And you know, because you've been in the room with the obnoxious person who's sure. going off, and that is before the next thing that Walter does, which is to pull a gun. Yeah. Oh my God. Has the whole world gone crazy? Am I the only one around here who gives a shit about the rules? Mark and Zero! They're calling the cops, man. Put the piece away. Mark and Zero! Walter, put the piece away. Walter? You think I'm fucking around there, Mark and Zero? And, and, and what's really fun, I don't think the movie gives enough attention to the terribleness of this moment. Right. Like, it actually pretty much almost ignores it from this point forward. Yeah. But he pulls a gun on Smokey. And, and it's loaded. And, and Oh, absolutely. Because when he takes the... He ejects oh, when the he clip, breaks the it clip down. has bullets in it. Yeah, no, he definitely is loaded. Nutty fuck. And you could see Donnie and the dude, like, going, what, what's happening here? Right, right. Um, and Smokey marks it as zero. He does. And I don't think that's the first time Walter's pulled the piece in front of them, which is why... They don't overreact to it or scream at him to stop. They're just like, oh, letting it happen, letting it play out. We're heading out of the alley. We're we're <laughs> we're in the car. We hear the sirens coming. Yes, which I love that you know that the polling alley called the police. You know they finished the game. Yeah, it took that long for the police to show up. And the dude and Walter. This is where you see the dysfunctional married cu yep. married couple. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. This is. I think that's a, something that has to be said to most of us at some point. <laughs> and, the, and there's no attention given to the cops pull up behind them or yep. running into the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what's interesting, what the Coen brothers said about this is that the dude is the most mellow guy in the world, but Walter always makes him lose it. Yeah. He can't. He just goes. The, the, the mellowness doesn't. There's always one person who has your buttons, man. <laughs> yeah. There's always one person. Yeah. And the dude keeps saying to Walter, just take it easy, man. I'm perfectly calm, dude. Yeah, waving the fucking gun around? Calmer than you are. Will you just take it easy? Calmer than you are. Calmer than you. <laughs> We're back to the dudes. There's a beautiful rug on the floor. Yep. He's listening. There's some answering machine messages. We hear we hear from Smokey that he's reporting this to the league. Yes. Uh, I love in the background, there's the photo of Nixon bowling. Yeah. Great picture. Fantastic. Uh, Brad calls uh, about Lebowski. Mm -hmm. um, the bowling league calls. And then the landlord, Marty, visits. <laughs> this is just where the weirdness of this movie. Yeah. Because he wants the dude to come see his dance quintet. You know, my cycle. <laughs> <laughs> And that guy's been in a million things. Great oh character God. actor. Really funny. And then at the end, asks him about the rent. Yeah. I'll let yeah. you know, too. It's been 10 days. Yeah. He's overdue by 10 days. Well, but he really wants him to come to the dance room. Yeah. And so he doesn't want to, if he asks for the rent first or makes kind of a big deal about it, because the dude's opinion, for some reason, is really important to him. Yep. He wants to get some notes. Right. <laughs> but, th but this is another Dashiell, Raymond Chandler type uh, element. This random character who comes in, talks to the main character, and for whatever reason has a respect for this main character, even though this person could essentially be in a more powerful position than the main character. And it just adds more. It's a character thrown in just to add a little more uh, 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 power to the main character. It's very interesting. Well, and it's a quintessentially L.A. thing. Yes. Like people talk about oh, this yeah. movie as being a totally L.A. movie. And I'm Absolutely. telling you, if you live in this town, mm -hmm. there is a guy in your apartment complex. Or a girl. Or a girl who has a play yep. or a monologue. A one or woman a, show. A or podcast. One man show. Yeah, or a podcast. <laughs> that yes. they want you to yes. do that. Like, and they desperately want you to read their screenplay or check out their thing yes. or watch their short film and please, you know and and, that, and the, what's funny is that's us too yeah like this is what this town is and wherever you are there is somebody else who whose approval you're desperately after Absolutely. to get them to help you with whatever the your with your cycle yeah um and then we hear from Brad again uh that they need his help um and and again dude's doing some tai chi by the way yes he is and we head back to Lebowski's who is oh. in seclusion. I mean, this whole shoulders down, 
head down Philip Seymour Hoffman thing that he's doing is brilliant. Him taking on the mood right. of the senior Lebowski is just brilliant. He he is toadying, if yes, you will. Toadying, yes, toadying, um, yes, absolutely. Not a word I don't know if I've ever used it before, but certainly applies here. Um, and we we go in, and what is uh, Big Lebowski doing in his library, or whatever? He is clearly monologuing. It is he is weeping and monologuing, and he oh. asks, "What makes a man? What makes a man, Mister Lebowski? Dude, huh?" Uh, I I don't know, sir. Is it being prepared to do the right thing? Whatever the cost. Isn't that what makes a man? Mm, sure, that and a pair of testicles. <laughs> you joke. You joke. <laughs> but you're not wrong. I love that. And the sound of the fires. Once again, how much of this is he involved in? Because it is such a dramatic thing for him to walk in, and he's sitting by the fire. And, of course, the, the movie plays that score, that uh, classical music score that's playing. It's right. very, very like, oh! And he walks in and sits there, and he has, like, he has to listen to this man do this monologue and talk about what makes a man. <laughs> and he's just like, dude, I, what do you need me for? Why am I here? You know? well, and his, his total disdain for the moment shows yeah. what he says, you mind if I burn a Jane or whatever? <laughs> yeah, burn a Jane, yeah. Whatever, whatever he says there. <laughs> um, and he lights a joint yeah. and starts smoking. And we, we see the uh, the um, the ransom note, the mm -hmm. classic sort of multi-fonted ransom note. Yep. And he goes, uh, bummer. Huh? This is a bummer, man. That's, uh, that's a bummer. <laughs> By the way, Jeff Bridges said before every scene, he and this is one of the things I, I, I know in doing a little bit of research, he said that he would ask the Coen brothers, the Coen brothers said they barely directed Jeff Bridges through the whole movie, and they and he, he said all the direction they gave him was or before every scene, Jeff Bridges would walk up and ask them, has the dude burned a joint before the scene? And they would say yes or no, and most of the times yes. <laughs> uh, and so Bridges would go in the corner and rub his eyes until they looked bloodshot. <laughs> Before he started the scene, it was incredible, man. It's, Things you do, yeah. It's. I don't know how you tell Jeff Bridges to play this part. Yeah, like, like I don't hope know how, he gets it. Yeah, like, like he and clearly he got it at a level. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I there are I can name five, seven, eight, nine, maybe even ten great Jeff Bridges performances. Yeah, I he's a really good actor. Yeah, there's nothing like this. No, the dude is the pinnacle for me of his. You know, just embodying this completely unique, you've never seen anything like this character on screen. And he said, some of this character was me in my 20s. He said, yeah. I did a lot of drugs. I was in these kind of places. And he goes, I felt I was a bit more creative than the dude. But yes, I've learned right. this experience. Uh, and if there's a reason, Steve, that there are Lebowski fests every year. Because the guy just, the, what he did with this character and what yep. the film is, is just really like affected a lot of people enough to respect and admire it and celebrate it. And, and, and what we find out <laughs> is that they want him to act as a courier for the money. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and right away, you're just, the way people, the way everybody treats yeah. the dude is so bizarre. Right. Like, why does, why, you know, we're going to get to a whole bunch of whys later on. He just, people welcome him in or get yeah. him in these situations. Um, and so he's going to ask for a courier for the money. And we're back to the bowling alley. Yeah. And now we meet the Jesus. By the way, great fucking song from the Gypsy Kings doing their version of Hotel California is incredible. It I is mean, amazing. It's such a good song. Almost as good as the original. Almost. I, it, and it's perfectly, mm -hmm. perfectly used in yes! the sequence. Yes, in the slow motion, everything, <laughs> licking the ball, I mean, the hairnet. The, the, the nail, the, the, nail, that's every, right, the nail. Every, every movement that happens in this scene is I just have to direct you to go watch it. Yeah. Even if you just go, even if you are too lazy to watch The Big Lebowski, which I can't imagine you are. Right. But even if, if you go like, no, I refuse to ever watch this film, <laughs> go on YouTube <laughs> and search for Lebowski, the Jesus, Jesus, and watch this montage because it is filmmaking perfection. This is how you do an introduction to a character. Oh my god! Incredible, just incredible. Well, you know the the expression like they're 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 no small characters, only small actors. Right. 
the Coen brothers get this, <laughs> yes. which is that every, like Marty, the landlord, who yes. comes in for one scene, yep. it's great. Mm -hmm. Like they get that even if you're in here for one moment, you have an opportunity to totally shine. Mm -hmm. And man, John Turturro, mm -hmm. and this was, from my understanding, this was mostly all him. Yeah. Like the 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 jumpsuit, the hairnet, like all these ideas, mm -hmm. this was all his ideas. The little dance he does yeah. in slow motion, oh my God, it's amazing. And there are rumors that he has shot a film he is shooting. I he think is shooting. He, I think he is Going shooting. places yeah. is what he call is what it's called with Audrey Tatu, where he's bringing this Jesus character back. Yeah, Coen Brothers have said there will never be a Lebowski sequel, but they gave yeah. him permission yeah. to use this character. I mean, the and, and and we find out that he is a uh, sex offender, a pederast. <laughs> What's a pederast, Walter? Shut the fuck up, Donnie. <laughs> the brief moment where you see him having to knock on people's doors. Oh, God, the guy that opens the door. Oh. See, and that's the thing they do so well, like you just brought up. Even the smallest thing with no lines, yeah. they cast perfectly, perfectly for effect. Yeah, yeah. and there's because that, that is a totally memorable moment of yeah. that guy opening the door. Because you could think the guy would punch him in the face if he said that. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's immediately what you think. Oh, sh And the look on, on Torturo's face yep. when that guy opens the door lets you know that that's a possibility. Well, and the contrast between that knocking on the door Jesus yes. and the guy that we see in the bowling alley yeah. where he is like a god. Of course. Uh, and, and as we are discussing this, um, uh, we start talking again about the case where Lebowski suddenly comes up with this idea of she probably kidnapped herself. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. You know, he owes money, you know, young trophy wife, married guy for his money, owes yep. money all over town. It's all fake. Um, and then and then he tries to quote yeah. Lenin, of course, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, and he starts to quote it, but he can't finish the quote. So Donnie starts throwing in, I am the walrus. And this is this thing that the Coen brothers do just as well as anybody I can think of, of this multi-layered dialogue where <laughs> Walter and the dude are having one conversation and Donnie keeps trying to throw in, I am the walrus. <laughs> And then Walter just loses his honor. Shut the fuck up, Donnie. The I Lenin. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. <laughs> and, and Donnie, no. I don't think, knows who Because he is. says, what's he talking about, dude? What's, what's Walter talking about, dude? And in the midst of this, we cut to mm -hmm. John Turturro mm -hmm. cle polishing his ball. <laughs> Him and the other guy, Liam, who we find out his name is Liam, polishing their balls in tandem. By the way, even that guy's a great. Yes. Like, he's perfect. Yes. I, I, I th does he have a line? I don't think so. Just uh, a look. Yeah. And he's perfect. And you go like, how did the Jesus get to be partners right. on this bowling team where they wear, wear purple jumpsuits together? <laughs> like, how did this come about? But the guy they cast to play Liam looks like he'd be have no problem having a pederast on his team as long as he can bowl. <laughs> as long as he can bowl well, that's all he cares about. And, Wa and Walter is starting to get pissed about the, this whole situation mm -hmm. against the wealthy people because he didn't watch his his buddies die face down in the mud, and, and he goes off on a Vietnam rant. Yeah. And and the dude's like, how, how did we? I don't see the connection to Vietnam. Well, not a literal connection, dude. I love the <laughs> switch in terms, that switch in approach when he does that. Yeah, Go Goodman does that so well. Yeah. Um, and up walks the Jesus. I see you roll your way into the semis. Dios mío, man. Liam and me, we're gonna fuck you up. Yeah. Well, you know that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Let me tell you something, Pandeo. You pull any of your crazy shit with us, you flash a piece out on the lanes, I'll take it away from you and stick it up your ass and pull the fucking trigger till it goes click. It's, it's just brilliant, the whole thing he throws back at him, because I think that's why the gun thing goes away, because Torturo kind of handles it with Jesus, being right. like, that's it, that you're never going to do that again. I'm going to kill your ass if you do, you know what I'm saying? So. And he ends with? Nobody fucks with the Jesus. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah. We're back at the dude's place. He's in a meditative moment, uh, lying uh, on the rug. What's listening, he listening? <laughs> what is Bob? What is Bob? <laughs> I don't know. This is the question I have, because one is like, oh, the 1987, whatever, finals, blah, 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 Palm Beach County, for whatever it is, and then side two, Bob. What is Bob? No. I want to know. I don't know. I mean, listening to bowling is like your Zen meditation. Um, and he opens his eyes. And there's Julianne Moore with yeah. two guys, and he gets punched out. La, 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 la. He's flying over his LA, the man in the meme with Bob Dylan. Yeah. Suddenly he's got a bowling ball in his hand. It pulls him down, screaming. Um, and we we end up on the like the ball return and the yeah. ball is coming towards him and he has to, I love that he has to make himself small to fit into the hole and I love the sound you hear the 
the point <laughs> when he goes into the hole, which is brilliant. And then that crazy POV bowling shot yeah. of the ball going, which apparently is they like mounted the camera to like a barbecue rotisserie or something. Oh. And that's what you're seeing as it rotates through. Brilliant. It is really, that's like a shot. And by the way, all the bowling shots, yeah, balls going down the lanes and stuff are amazing. There's one they have kind of a motorized like skateboard to have the camera on it oh. so that it can follow or lead the ball oh, that's great. as it goes down the lane. Those shots are really cool. Yep. And he wakes up to the sound of the beeper. <laughs> the rug is gone. Yeah. And there's this great top-down shot that's kind of pulling away as it spirals mm -hmm. up. And he's back with Brad, is giving him uh, some instructions. There's only going to be one person to do this money drop off. Um, he gives him the briefcase. He gives him a huge, huge, what we'll call a mobile phone <laughs> from back in the day. And then says, her life is in your hands, dude. Don't say that, man. <laughs> Mr. Lebowski asked me to repeat that. Her life is in oh, your shit. hands. Yeah. Her life is in your hands, dude. Her life, life is in your hands. hands. <laughs> Uh, and he's supposed to go alone, so naturally, what does he do? Picks up Walter. He brings Walter. Yeah. Well, Walter invites himself, doesn't he? Yeah, but you don't have to. I get guess him. so. I guess so. But he, he, he and he brings a, a decoy uh, a briefcase full of his undies. The ringer. Yeah, the ringer. Yeah, what he calls. And the what's ringer. it? And it's filled with the whites. Yeah. <laughs> I love the repetition of the whites. My like, dirty undies. Important. The whites. Yeah. <laughs> the whites. <laughs> um, um, and because why? Why does he want to do that? Because Walter wants to take all the money. He's such a buffoon, Walter. Oh yeah. my god. And, and then the, the, the phone rings, and he answers the phone, and he says, where do you want us to go? Yeah. Us? <laughs> hangs up the phone. <laughs> but Walter's right here, because the dude says, oh, man, you fucked us, man. I don't know what's blah, blah, blah. Walter, they're going to call back, dude. They're going to call back. Right. And sure enough, they call back. Of course back. they do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they say, okay, we'll do it. And they say, send them, you know, we're going to send you off to some bridge and they're mm -hmm. driving off. Um, and Walter has the plan, which is he's going to sneak around with his Uzi yeah. and beat the truth out of them uh, and keep the money. The beauty of this is its simplicity. Once the plan gets too complex, everything can go wrong. There's one thing I learned in Nam. <laughs> oh my God, just the stupidity of it all. <laughs> This man does not look like he's seen any kind of workout program in his entire, mm -hmm. like since he left the fucking service, and he thinks he's gonna fall out or dive out of a moving car with an Uzi in a wrapped uh, cardboard paper, <laughs> whatever it is, and and be able to you know do this assault in essence, this military assault. Here's the thing though, because of course I agree with everything you said, <laughs> except. Yeah. That when we get to the movie, he does, in fact, take out all three of those guys single-handedly. Eventually, yes. He does. But not in this moment. <laughs> no, because and he does. I love that he's just Stupid like going. Because because originally he was going to, they were going to, thought they were going to stop. But yeah. now since they're going to throw the money off of a bridge, Walter goes, well, obviously now I have to jump out of the moving car. So we get down to 15 miles per hour. I'm going to go out. Dude's going, what are you talking about? Walter, Walter 15, dude. This is it. Walter, Walter, Walter. Walter. And he leaps out of the car. The Uzi hits the ground, yep. starts spinning around, <laughs> firing, takes out the tire of the car. Yep. The dude crashes the car. <laughs> yep. And Walter and, has a knee injury. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the dude gets out with the metal briefcase yeah. going, no, no, I have the money, I have the money. And the nihilists or whoever, they ride off on their motorcycles. Yep. Um, so this did not this did not go well. No. What a surprise. To which Walter's response is, fuck it, dude. Let's, <laughs> Let's go bowling. Go bowling. <laughs> We're back at the bowling alley, yeah. and we're sitting there. Walter is bowling, and the phone is ringing mm -hmm. and ringing and ringing, and the dude is not answering. And he's like, what are we going to tell Lebowski? And Walter's like, what's the problem? Right. <laughs> Seems all fun, because Walter has accepted the fact that when the dude said that she was faked the kidnapping, that that must therefore be true. Yeah. And the dude is kind of back on her life is in your hands and going, that poor woman... Um, and, and and then Donnie wakes up because they posted the next round of league play. Yeah. And, and I love Walter going, shut the fuck up. Oh, when do we play? Because <laughs> shut the fuck up, Donnie, is like a natural instinct yeah. with him. Um, he is so horrible to Donnie. Oh, God, he's terrible. Horrible. Through the whole movie. Awful. Mm -hmm. He's a bully. He's a oh, fucking bully. Terrible bully. Yeah. Um, and uh, the next bit of league play is on Saturday. Oh, no. No, you can't do that. You can't bowl on Shabbos, dude. Show him Shabbos. Saturday, Donnie, is Shabbos, the Jewish day of rust. That means I don't work. I don't we'll drive a car. I don't fucking ride in a car. I don't handle money. I don't turn on the oven. And I sure as shit don't fucking roll. You talk to me about this. You're Jewish. What does this mean, Shabbos? 
Well, the Shabbos, I can tell you, I would never heard the word Shomer Shabbos. It shows like how much of a Jew I am. Um, so the Shabbos is the day of rest. On the seventh day, God rested. Right. And so in traditional, particularly in Orthodox Judaism, yeah. you um, aren't allowed to do anything. So oh. so you, it's because... Because the word is like you shouldn't work on the on the on the Sabbath, and so how do we interpret that? And the most literal interpretations, you go well. Every what is work? And so driving a car is work, cooking food is work, gotcha. cleaning the house is work. That you are supposed to rest, yeah. to read Torah, to contemplate Scripture, to be with family. Mm -hmm. And so like there are uh, Orthodox Jews who there's like a special kind of stew yeah. that you could put in the oven the day before, and so you can take it out and it'll be perfectly you know, delicious the next day. So therefore you don't have to cook. There's even things about toilet paper and stuff like that. Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine who said like, you can't even use the elevator on some days, like any kind of like, you can't even push the buttons on the elevator. So that's why you can't leave your apartment. If you live in an elevator, uh, accessible apartment, uh, because you, you it, it's, it's it all essentially work. Yeah. yeah, it all depends on how you interpret. Yeah. What does it mean to take a day of rest? But it's, the Sabbath for, for Jewish people is on a Saturday? So it's Friday night, Saturday day, because wow. the day begins at sunset. Okay. So that's why, like, they always start. So, so it'll go from sunset on Friday night right. till sunset on Saturday, wow. and then after, uh, that's and that's for that's just how the day is structured in the Jewish right. calendar. For Catholics, it's Sunday. The right. Sabbath, so it's interesting how it's so, two somewhere different. along the line they just switch days. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> we got to be different. Got to be different. <laughs> I always wonder when that happened. By the way, I think the Buddhist is on Wednesday. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, they're always at rest with themselves. That's, that's true. Much Boom. And he's like, "No, I can't. I don't work. I don't drive a car." And and the dude walks out, and and we, you know, he just exits the bowling alley, and then they stop. Say, dude, where's your car? Because the car is missing. And this is again. This goes to like that weird, uh, you know, Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett plot structure of yeah. just weird things keep happening, and we don't actually, you know, it's like in those old detective novels. Yeah. They, it's not like they're in charge of an investigation. Mm -hmm. They keep running into people who keep taking them to other places. Of course, and that's what's happening here. It's like, oh, now the car's gone. Well, the whole film is, yeah, you're right, Steve, because every one of these things, like in all these films that this is based on. Every time the main guy thinks he's got something squared away, something new comes along to mess him up out of the blue, out of nowhere. Yeah. And then he's he has to start all over again, in essence, trying to figure it all out. And yeah. this is the thing about this movie, and this is part of what some of the criticism of this movie was, yeah. is the dude is not an active character. No. He doesn't really do anything. Yeah. Like, he like he does make the choice to take Lebowski's rug, and but he picks up Walter. Right. His car gets stolen. Like, all these things are kind of happening to him well and I, th I think the coen brothers used uh the long goodbye as a kind right. of a basis as well when they were writing if you haven't seen the long goodbye i came to it two years ago at the new beverly cinema i mm. went by myself to watch it elliot gould is incredible film uh, a really quiet detective film that is an interesting film from the 70s right with elliot gould's style Right. of acting it's really interesting so and of course dude just goes i'm gonna walk home and that phone's still ringing mm -hmm. and now we're gonna talk to the cops about the stolen car <laughs> again another perfect example of two yeah. bit parts that are 100 percent characters richard grant is fantastic <laughs> the black guy the black actor richard who people might remember from rocky five right he's right. the don king guy in rocky five and the guy on the right is if you ever watched boston legal he's the guy that plays uh, the guy who has uh asperger syndrome oh. i met that guy once in a costco <laughs> Very nice guy. Very nice guy. And he's and it's so and you can tell that there's the guy on the right yeah. that is eager. He's very nice. And yeah. Very nice. And the <laughs> other guy, he's just couldn't. He's wait. seen it all. This he's is stupid. And I love they get into the the uh, tape deck and the credence yeah. tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and and then he also mentions you know oh when I also had a rug stolen was it in the car no oh so we're talking two separate two incidents sevens. and then Maud calls saying I have the rug and they're like oh. I guess we've solved, we've closed one of the cases. <laughs> um, so we go to meet Maud. Oh. This is this this scene is we've gone to a whole other level of strangeness. Yeah, dude. He walks into this weird space. There's this weird music playing, which I think is by Meredith Monk. It's called the Walking Song. Sure. It's kind of breathing and surreal he sees paint on the ground he's in this hallway there's this painting in the distance and then flying in overhead on a harness nude <laughs> nude julianne moore yeah. <laughs> painting her painting yeah which i i understand i don't know the name is based on a real painter that painted nude hung from the ceiling really yes Very, people are weird <laughs> julianne moore and again there's this weird boogie nights connection because mm -hmm. 
I first discovered, you know, like there's Boogie Nights and there's this, and these performances are amazing. Yeah. And what she does with her voice, with her whole style, the hairstyle, the whole thing yeah. is so bizarre and funny. Does the female fall make you uncomfortable, Mr. Lebowski? Uh, is that what this is a picture of? In a sense, yes. My art has been commended as being strongly vaginal, which bothers some men. The word itself makes some men uncomfortable. Vagina. It's so on point the way she says it. Vagina. And, and what she says is that this is not an accent. It's an affectation. Yes. The way she talks. I think that's 100% true. Mm -hmm. It is a snooty East Coast, some prep finishing school. Yep of rich people talk mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then she talks about and this is because i you know it's th they're about to do the same thing which is they bring up these different names for penises and one of the ones they list is an old-fashioned one which is your johnson yeah um and johnson is a word that comes back later in this weird way oh, yeah that's why i wanted to bring up the thing about chinaman yeah. is that they do this thing twice and uh, and we hear very quickly that the rug was her mother's and shouldn't have been hers. Right. And she thinks that uh, the the woman kidnapped her, her, herself. But then we kind of move right past that because now she's asking him. Do you like sex, Mr. Lebowski? Excuse me? Sex, the physical act of love. Coitus. Do you like it? I was talking about my rug. You're not interested in sex? You mean coitus? <laughs> <laughs> and that's where, as you say, he is smarter mm -hmm. than he is being, he's, because he is laughing at these ridiculous yes. things that are happening to yes. him. But this is also, she goes on this whole tangent about how, you know, uh, it's a commonly, misheld, uh, mis a commonly held misconception that feminists don't like or don't like right. sex and blah, blah, blah. And then she talks about nymphomania. And she talks about all this. Now, by the way, this is something I didn't know. Right. I didn't know nymphomaniacs are people who fuck for, for no pleasure. I thought it's mm. because the desire to feel pleasure all the time is the drive. But what she says is they they're incapable of love because they just they just have sex as a as a way of having sex. It just I doesn't don't mean anything. I know what the definition is. Yeah. So I yeah. don't know if what she says is the truth. Mm. And she says that there's a word for male nymph and mania, yes. which is related to satyr, but yeah. which I'd also never heard. Yep. But look, Maud is very smart. So she we just, I don't think we supposedly can supposedly quite smart. <laughs> um it, it, dude's just like listen, Maud. Um I'm sorry if your stepmother is a nympho, but uh, you know I don't see what this has to do with. Uh, you have any Kahlua? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the choice of Kahlua and cream and vodka, as a which I never heard called a Caucasian, it was a White Russian. Yeah. Um, as as the drink for the dude is just awesome. It is a very sweet, fat, fattening. It's a great drink. It's delicious. I love that damn drink. I, I really, I really meant to make them for you. For That's me. all right. I mean, it's nine in the morning. Yeah, so. I was gonna say, <laughs> but still. And then she says, you know, oh, take a look at this, sir. And she puts on a videotape. Yes. And there we see Carl Hungus. Great name. P Peter Stormary and and uh, and he's like, oh, I know that guy. He's a nihilist. <laughs> and we do see Jackie Treehorn presents once again. Jackie that name Tre again, Jackie yeah. Treehorn. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we see that oh, Bunny is in a porn mm -hmm. with this guy, Carl Hungus. And we hear then a little bit more about the Little Lebowski Urban whatever it is yeah. Federation Foundation. And now we get another key piece to our plot, which is that the Big Lebowski actually embezzled the money from there the go. foundation. Mm -hmm. Oh, something going on here. Yes. He's a he's more into this situation than he leads on. Right. And now she goes, <laughs> because this makes perfect sense, mm -hmm. I want you to recover the money for me, and I will give you a 10% fee, which would be $100,000, right. because she doesn't want to involve the cops, so she's naturally going to hire for a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> this stoner that she just met yeah this is where he gets like why are people treating him this way what is going on um and the last thing she gives him is the name of a doctor he's a good man and thorough uh, that, that, that's thoughtful but please see him jeffrey he's a good man and thorough so she knows ahead of time that she might uh have a baby with him the question's about sex <laughs> Making her Absolutely. see the doctor. She's planning this out. Once again, all these people are using him in these interesting ways. And they're planning it out way way in advance. And it's so weird. Like, <laughs> why did she pick, of all people, yeah. not only to recover her million dollars, yeah. but also to be the genetic parent of her <laughs> child, <laughs> the but, dude. And that's what I think about that's great about the film. The film is uh, skewering these cultures, subcultures, oh, yeah. while also highlighting them. Right? Yeah. They're not as avant-garde artistic. They still come down to the primal need of sex. No matter what. You could dress it up however you want. You could paint it. You could fly in 
on harnesses and do whatever and wear these interesting clothes and whatever. But at the end of the day, you're still a human being. You're still an animal. And your animal desire and primal desire for sex and procreation and whatever is still there. You can dress it up all you want. It's still there. Uh, we're in a limo. He's drinking his Caucasian. Dom Herrera driving the Dom limo. Dom Herrera. I love Dom. Give it a monologue. Another great character. Got a racial my ass. Forget about it. <laughs> oh, and one key thing that we see when he's with uh, the first limo is that he's being followed by a Volkswagen. Uh, yep, a blue uh, Volkswagen. Blue Someone Volkswagen. in a blue Volkswagen. Um, we get out of the car. He gets grabbed by another chauffeur. <laughs> hey, hey, careful, man. There's a beverage here, huh? And we get dragged into this other limo, and there is Lebowski, the big Lebowski, and Brad. Start talking and talk fast, you lousy bum. We've been frantically trying to reach you, dude. <laughs> now, every little thing that Philip Seymour Hoffman throws in is hilarious. Yeah. This is our concern, dude. I mean, all this of that. Our concern. All of that. Because he, so he has to deliver the message softer than because he knows Lebowski can deliver it like like a, a a bunch of bricks through windows, and Brad has to deliver it a little softer. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Make it polite, exactly. Yes. Um, and then uh, again, Lebowski, do, the dude lets slip that it was a we. Mm -hmm. And then he does one of my all time favorite stammering explanations the royal we. You know, the editorial, I dropped off the money exactly as per. Look, man, I've got certain information, all right? Certain things have come to light. And, you know, has it ever occurred to you that uh, instead of. Uh, you know, running around uh, uh, blaming me, you know, given the nature of all this new shit, you know, it, 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 this could be a, a, a lot more uh, 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 complex. I mean, it's not just, it might not be just such a simple, uh, you know? What in God's holy name are you blathering about? I mean, it's such a fantastic yeah. stumble speech. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the new information is she kidnapped herself. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time he starts talking about this like a case. Yeah. Like he's a private, an actual private eye. New, new stuff has come to light. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's this information about the money she owes to known pornographers. And he asks, has that ever occurred to you, man? Yeah. And no, it has not occurred to me. Which he's lying. Well, except that he, it, it depends on how, because the, what's funny about this movie is that we are going to kind of get to the solution of the mystery yeah, yeah. and then totally abandon it. Yes. Um, Because he might have wanted her to be killed. Yeah. And that's why he didn't give him the money, oh. hoping that he be, she'd be right. killed exactly. if he believed the kidnappers. Right. But we don't ever get to know because we never return to those people. True. Um, And as he's saying, no, she kidnapped herself, they give him the envelope. Yep. And what does he pull out of the envelope? A toe. A toe. With nail polish on. Green nail polish. Yeah. yeah. What's funny is the dude, if I pull a toe out of an envelope, I'm going to go, ah! Right. And dude's just like, huh, there's a toe. Um, and, and Lebowski threatens him. Anything that happens to her will come on you tenfold. Mm -hmm. Which me is going like, you're saying that he has to lose all ten of his toes right now? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a clear ten to one ratio. Yep. Uh, we end up at a diner with Walter. Uh, it's just good. That wasn't her toe, dude. I can get your toe. I can get your toe. Believe me. There are ways, dude. Well, you don't want Walter, to know about it, believe me. Yeah, but Walter. Hell, I can get you a toe by three o'clock this afternoon with nail polish. I get you a toe. <laughs> and then and then and then somehow we get to Vietnam again. Yes. And he starts going off. Mm -hmm. Uh and by the way, this is shot at Johnny's. Yes. Right across I used to live literally across the street from there when I first moved to LA. I live five minutes from there, drive yeah. by it all the time. It is a famous movie location. Mm -hmm. Johnny's on Wilshire Boulevard at Fairfax. They, it's never open for anything. Nope. It only it's just a filming just location. For, yeah, shoots. Um and uh, finally, the dude leaves, and Walter's like, nope, I'm just going to stay here drinking my coffee. The bathtub. <laughs> oh, Lord. Once again, he's trying to zen out. Yep, smoking listening, a J. Listening to the bowling, smoking a J. Um, we hear that the LAPD has found his car and a message. Mm-hmm. Um, Far out, man. And in comes the nihilists. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> With Flea as one of the nihilists. Yes, from Red Hot Chili Peppers. And uh, Doing the worst German accent. <laughs> and uh, apparently, by the way, the, the Stormary character came from Joel Cohn and Stormary talking to each other in fake German accents ah. on Fargo. That makes sense. And that's where this character came from. And they have a marmot. 
Yes. <laughs> they throw in the bathtub, which is, <laughs> there's something very scary about scary that. Scary as fuck about that. Are you yeah. kidding? I mean, I don't know anything about marmots. It's essentially a rodent, a large rodent, hairy <laughs> right rodent. Right in your crotchal yeah, your area. Johnson. In your Johnson, right you might your say. Johnson, which is exactly what they threaten to cut off. Yeah, that's right. they use this weird word. That's what I mean by, it's not funny in itself, but it's funny yeah. that these two characters, totally separate from each other, use this strange, archaic term. That's true. Um, and they want the money, Lebo we want the money, Lebowski. Um, and they, they, and they go, well, no, we're nihilists. We believe in nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I love the, I love the mm -hmm. use of nihilists. But all this will come together in a little bit. This idea of all these terms being used by the same people is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and now we're at the police impound lot. We, yeah. You get the oh. car. By the way, this, uh, Latino actor who plays the cop, uh, I love him whenever he shows up. Stuff, yeah, yeah. And whenever he shows up in anything. He's so interesting to watch. And the exact same thing we said now over and over and over mm -hmm. again. He has a great moment. He's yep. a full character. Because he asked, the briefcase had gone, of course, and he asked, yep. are there any leads? Um, <laughs> <laughs> leads, I'll just check down with the boys in the crime lab. <laughs> we got four detectives on this, man. They're working around on shifts. They're working in shifts. <laughs> Fortunately, though, the tape deck and the Credence tapes are still there. Yeah, thank God. Look, I like Credence. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like Credence too. I mean, I'd rather have a million dollars in a briefcase, but but yeah, but there wasn't it wasn't a million dollars in that briefcase. <laughs> no, but what was in the car? Some smell. Yeah, some horrible <laughs> vagrant might have used it as a latrine kind of smell. Um, we're back at the bowling alley. Yeah, um, and now Lebowski's worried about someone cutting off his uh, his Johnson. Johnson. And and he could just be sticking with pea stains if he had just left this whole thing alone. And and now Walter's going off, oh, fucking Germans, fucking Nazis. <laughs> Donnie goes, they were Nazis. It's like, no, man, they're nihilists. They, they, they keep saying they believe in nothing. And I love, I love Walter's response, which is... Niles. Fuck me. I mean, say what you want about the tenets of National Socialism, dude. At least it's an ethos. <laughs> ethos. That's a great, great fucking line. At least it's an ethos. I mean, that's and that's what I love about Walter is that he's an idiot. Yeah, he is. But he says some cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, at least it's an ethos. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Misguided intelligence. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the dude's had just about enough. Because yeah. he's worried about his Johnson. Sure. And he says, fuck you, Walter. Fuck the tournament. Yeah. And Walter, fuck the tournament. Whoa. That is big, big stuff. Well, I see you. You Clearly, you don't want to be cheered up here, dude. Uh, let's go, Donnie. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's yeah. friends with Donnie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fuck. The, well, <laughs> he said fuck the tournament. <laughs> John. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> it's true. Fair point. Hey, fuck the tournament. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, can you imagine like, someone said fuck the cinephiles? Oh, no. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so they leave, and he heads over to the you know the bar or whatever. Yeah. And what song do we hear starting to play? Tumbling, yeah. tumbleweeds. Yeah. And now we go back to this place, which in my mind I think we've completely forgotten about. Yeah. I mean, I have it now because I've seen the movie over and over right. again. But at the time, it's like you could that whole weird Western Sam Elliott opening. Yeah. It's like that was it had nothing to do with anything. And now we hear tumbling tumbleweeds. And there we see Sam Elliott in his full Sam Elliottness. How you doing there, dude? Not too good, man. One of those days, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then there's this moment where Sam Elliott looks at the dude and says, I like your style, dude. What the fuck is happening here? <laughs> like, there's almost this He's... thing of like, is he picking up the dude? Yeah. I think he's just admiring him. He's just <laughs> admiring him. I like your style, dude. And and then, you know, Jeff Bridges leans back and looks back and says the same thing. He's like, yeah. You yeah, got, like, got the, the whole, whole Western. cowboy, the Western cowboy, the, yeah. Um, take her easy, dude. <laughs> You're just one thing, dude. What's that? You have to use so many cuss words. The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it is so funny. Yeah. It is so and so odd. And this is one of the things too about the Cone Brothers is that what I teach my students is in general, if if you could take out a scene and it would have zero effect on the rest of the movie, then you should probably take it out. Yeah. You know, and and I'd say 90% of the time that's true. Not in Cone Brothers movies. No, no, no. They will have a thing in there 
like the uh, whatever it is the the Japanese guy in Fargo where she goes to yeah. the city oh. and there's a whole you're such a special lady. Oh my god, I'm so lonely. But it's just it's just to convey how unsettling that world is that she's living in yeah. at the time. Well, and 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 the scene, but I swear you could lift you that whole scene oh, absolutely, and you, you would never it. know. But it certainly it, adds to the that element. scene is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this this is a similar thing. So many of the things in this movie mm-hmm. are just like. I don't know what that is. And I think that's part of why seeing it the first time, you kind of go, huh. Yeah. And as you see it more and more, it's all those little things. Mm-hmm. Marty, the landlord, and the cop with the crime lab, and the, you know, all these little right. things. You go, my God, I love all of this. Right. And of course, at the bar, he gets a call at the, at the bar. Of course he does. You haven't seen that doctor yet, Jeffrey. <laughs> I'd like to see you immediately. And we go back to Mon's studio. Mm-hmm. And there is David Thulis. Oh, my God. I didn't know that was him. Yeah. I had, cause I didn't, I mean, cause he's so different in the mm-hmm. scene. Mm-hmm. Oh my. It, it, he's a young actor there. He's very thin. Yeah. Uh, and he's from Blackpool, England. So his accent is very close to a Liverpoolian accent. Mm. They're like, Blackpool is real close to Liverpool. So you, it's, he's, it's his natural accent, which is great to hear. And he plays this weird, oh. artsy, giggling character. Yeah. And what Coen Brothers said about the scene is that the reason they put him in was because they felt that the scene between Maude and the dude was just purely expositional. Yeah. And so they said, let's just add another element, which is another great mm-hmm. screenwriting room. Just add a crazy person giggling through yeah. the whole scene, and it's completely different. Yeah. Um, and Maude enters, uh, and he, the dude's like, maybe I should tender my resignation or whatever. And then she gives him some more information, which is that the Nihilus and the album cover and... How much of this are you really following? Oh, well, this is where I think the connective tissue is because she says, I might have introduced Bunny and uh, Peter Stormari's character. So she's talked. So she knew them in her whole artistic, weird life, met them when they were doing Mm. some German album. And you can see from the cover, it's very much like an old 80s German uh, synth pop group or some shit. Right. Uh, The Autobahn, which is an incredibly funny name for them to use. Uh, and so she might have introduced them at a party. Then they got into porno. Then they got into all this kind of stuff. And that's maybe why they use Johnson. Why they because they all have a kind of connection with it all. And, and again, uh, Lebowski talks about this is a very complicated case. Yeah, <laughs> I love that it has now fully become a case. It lots of ins and outs, yep. strands in old Duder's head. And and she continues to push him to go to the doctor. And then she gets on this phone call where she speaks in some language, yeah. laughing hysterically. It is a funny scene. And they're all on the phone call, which makes it really unsettling. It's really weird yeah. and awkward and funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we go to the doctor. He gets maybe a far more thorough exam than he might have expected. And he seems extremely happy about it as he's driving home. Yep. To the Credence. Credence, out my back door, man. Yeah, he's I, like dinging, banging the roof of the car, happy as shit. Listen, I went to, through a serious Credence phase. <laughs> Probably like in the early 90s. Oh, yeah. I listened sure. to a lot of Credence. Credence I like great. Credence. And uh, the VW is, is uh, following him. He mm-hmm. sees the VW, drops his joint in his crotch, <laughs> puts it out with some beer. Oh, my God. Slam, crashes the car. That car's been through a lot. The things that happen to his penis. It's incredible. To this whole movie. Please. It's Johnson. It's Johnson. Sorry. Can't get out of the driver's side go- door because that doesn't open anymore. Right. He looks in the back seat and finds a kid's school paper. Boom. Uh, we're at the dance recital. I think uh, Marty is doing some beautiful work in his cycle. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Walter comes in wearing a suit. And he has gotten the address for Larry, the kid that wrote the paper. Yep. It's up in North. It's funny because I didn't know my way around L.A. that well when I first saw it. Mm-hmm. Of course, now I know exactly what they're talking yep. about. Way up in North Hollywood and uh, and near the In-N-Out Burger, which is yep. what Donnie says. Uh, those are good burgers. Shut yep. the fuck up, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to that In-N-Out many times. There's. Uh, we find out that the dad was the father of an old TV show. Yeah. Branded. Branded. He wrote the bulk of the series, dude. He wrote the bulk of the series. Uh, we're going to go up there. We're going to threaten this kid. We're going to get the money back. We go up to North Hollywood. What's parked in front of the house? It's a beautiful red sports car. Brand new Corvette. And they're like, oh, shit. He's obviously spent the money already on this car. And they come in, and there's a, a, a Latino woman who answers the door. Mm-hmm. And she goes, oh, the police are here to see you. <laughs> we didn't want to give you the impression that we were the police, man. <laughs> and there's a guy in an iron lung. Yeah. Which is again, this is a total. I don't remember. I cannot remember if it's Big Sleep or Maltese Falcon. Yeah. I think it's Maltese Falcon that has the guy in the iron lung, but okay. that is definitely out of one of those. And I love they go, does he still write? No, he has health problems. 
And then we just lay into Do- to Larry. Poor Larry. <laughs> what the fuck is going on with Larry? I, I have no idea. <laughs> it's like a stone face through the whole thing. Yeah. And you're like, is he pure evil? Yeah. Is he scared? Is he an idiot? Right. We don't know, but they get nothing out of Larry. Mm-hmm. So Walter kind of loses it. Big time. You might want to watch out that front window, Larry. Son, this is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass. He goes outside. He gets, what's he, is it a crowbar or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crowbar. It starts beating the crap out of that beautiful red Corvette. Right. This is the most upsetting thing in the movie, actually, to me, is beating up that beautiful car. And this guy comes running out, who's the neighbor. What are you doing to my new car? I just bought it. Because, of course, it's not Larry's car. No. And then what does he do is he goes, grabs something, and starts beating the shit out of the dude's car. Uh, The dude's car. Which, to me, is not payback at all. That car is already beat up. Right. (laughs) But in that moment, you're just flipping out. And by the way, much like pulling the gun in the bowling alley, this is something that apparently never has consequences. Yeah. Like, that was... He, Walter should go to jail probably you know um, but we don't really care and we end up driving away uh, with the guys eating although it didn't look like in and out packaging no but they're eating burgers and driving away from with no windshield <laughs> <laughs> so this has not gone well um, oh and the music again the great soundtrack as they're driving away oh you'll come over yeah yeah Santana great stuff now we're back at the dude's apartment he's hammering this board into the floor he's got a new security plan because then he takes a chair locks the chair onto the board puts it up under the door because that's going to prevent every anyone from ever coming in and the door opens the wrong way (laughs) and in come our guy we saw for the very beginning of the movie yep um and they go jackie treehorn wants to see you yeah hard cut to a woman yes floating up into the black in slow motion. In beautiful slow motion. Yeah. She's not wearing a top. Nope. This is a remarkable filmic <laughs> moment. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about it. I'm just saying there's some beautiful filmmaking at work. Well, it's a porn place. You it's know, a por- what do you expect? They, it's a porn I, party. They have made, I think the world of Jackie Treehorn is so much cooler than what I actually think the world of Hugh Hefner was like. Probably, yeah. I mean, this is, he's in some sort of like Aztec environment on the beach with huge bonfires, yep. big porn party. And we have our introduction to Jackie Treehorn, Ben Gazzara. Ben Gazzara. Another fantastic actor who comes in and just kills it for one scene. Well, he went through a, a mini little run here during this time too in his life, uh, during this time in the in the 90s and early 2000s because Buffalo 66, he was the dad in Buffalo 66 with Christina Ricci. Right, right. And so he had these little like things where he'd pop up and all of a sudden like would work in a number of films and then boom, right back down again. So yeah. Yeah, he's great. One. Yeah. Uh, we get a white Russian, of course. <laughs> um, we have a little discussion of, of porn where he says the brain is the biggest erogenous zone. Mm-hmm. And I love the response because the dude says for you, maybe. <laughs> and I realized that has multiple meanings. Mm-hmm. Cause it could be that like, I disagree. Right. Like I have, I think there are other areas that are more interesting or it could be a size joke. I think it's a size joke. Of what is the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Once again, a little more prepared than you think, and and, and again and and again, the dude is sort of talking about this like it's a case, yeah. that he's working, uh, lots of ins and outs, interested parties. Uh, Jackie Treehorn gets a phone call, and and he's he's kind of sketched something on the pad of paper when he gets the phone call, and then he has to rush out and do something. Uh, I love the little tiptoeing dude, yeah. to go over to the pad of paper and do this great like side of the pencil trick yeah. to see what had been sketched on it from the impression made by the pressure of the pen before. Mm-hmm. And what does he discover? <laughs> it's a big old cock. <laughs> big old cock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that is his most detective-y moment. Yeah. That is the only time in the movie where he actually has sees a way to get a clue <laughs> and it ends up being well, what it is. Um, and, and and then Gazar comes back, and it is fascinating how much respect everybody is giving the dude. Yep. And he, he offers him a 10% finder's fee to recover the money. Yep. And dude gives him Larry's address, and then he starts to look a little fucked up as he's drinking his drink. Yep. And he's like, kind of write me a check, and he's starting to stumble and says, hell of a Caucasian, Jackie. Voices are echoing. The guys show up. He drops the drink. All the dude ever wanted was his rug back. I greet him. Really. Tied the room together. And his face slams down straight into camera. Yep. In a great shot. 
Then we go into a dream sequence. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, what condition my condition was in. Dude. I, this is where the movie to me is like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> the, the Busby Berkeley thing. I it's mean, so great. It is crazy. We start with Jackie Treehorn Presents. Yeah. A beautiful shot of a pin going up between two bowling balls. I will Hello. leave it to your imagination. <laughs> the fantastic Kenny Rogers and the first edition. Yes. With what condition my condition is in. God, this I is love a that great song. Great song. Yeah. Great song. Dude enters in this huge space. There's the world's largest rack of bowling shoes. <laughs> and who is serving out the bowling <laughs> shoes? Saddam. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Naturally. Jeff Bridges with his big crazy eyes dancing down the stairs in gold and silver bowling shoes. Yeah. Julianne Moore is wearing like a Viking breastplate and helmet, which apparently she was pregnant at the time. Oh. And this was not very comfortable. She could barely move in the thing. I bet. And as you say, we go into a big Busby Berkeley yep. number. Um, <laughs> there's, by the way, the shot where he flies through the legs of the... Apparently he was too wide to fit through their legs. Oh. So this is a composite shot. So this is a motion controlled camera doing multiple passes. Oh. And they shrunk him down and then composited him in How to funny. that shot. Yeah. Okay. So this is like Star Wars technology. Yeah. Making him fly through his legs. <laughs> um, and we end with in the black, the Nihilus yep. with giant scissors. <laughs> Coming to cut off his jaws. <sighs> I've had a couple of nights in that way. <laughs> and then he's just running down the street. Yeah. And it's a great transition to him just freaking out running down the street. Yep. Back of the police car, singing the song from Branded. Yeah. It was written by our guy in the Iron Lung. Mm -hmm. And we end up with the Malibu chief of police. Oh, God, this guy. <laughs> this guy. I love that his only idea is his Ralph's card. <laughs> Ralph's, for those of you who don't live in Los Angeles, is a grocery chain. Mm -hmm. um, and he's looking through his stuff. And what else does he find? That doodle of the big cock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and of course, Jackie Treehorn said he was ejected from this party for right. behaving correctly. It seems like Treehorn has a fair amount of power in Malibu. Yes. Um, and this cop is not being nice to him at all. Nope. Uh, the dude gives him a little sass. Gets Throws the fucking mug at his head. Yep. That's a soul battery by cop. Totally is. Totally is. Stay out of Malibu, Lebowski. Yeah. I love how it lives and it leaves an imprint on his forehead. Yep. And now we're in a taxi driving home. Yep. Listen to Peaceful Easy Feeling by the Eagles. Man, he fucking hates the Eagles, man. Hates. So first of all, I love the Eagles. Yeah, the Eagles are great. Yeah, I love Peaceful Easy Feeling. I think that's a great song. Absolutely. So there's a funny story about this. So uh, they wanted, I can't remember the title of the song right now, but they wanted a Rolling Stone song for the credit. Mm. Uh, which they And, and they first, when uh, T-Bone Burnett first goes out to whoever controlled the Rolling Stones rights, he says, we want $150,000 for this song. Which, by the way, now is not actually that much money for a big song. But wow. that was a ton of money. Right. And they're like, look, this is, we don't have a big budget on this movie. We can't do this. Finally, they go out and they screen the movie for this guy. And the guy's enjoying the movie. And when they get to the line where the dude says, I hate the fucking Eagles, the guy says, okay, done. <laughs> I'll give it to you for cheap. <laughs> really? He Because he hated the Eagles, too. <laughs> and there is a weird Eagles hatred. There's just like people yeah. hate them. Yeah. And I, I don't get it. I discovered that too. It was really fascinating to me because they think the Eagles shouldn't be respected as well as they are. They, they Some people see them as just a glorified soft rock band. And I'm like, you're insane. And if you've ever, and if you're listening and you're an Eagles fan, if you haven't seen the three and a half hour documentary oh, that they did on the Eagles uh, last year no, or a year, yeah, it's a little bit over a year ago, it's incredible. One of the most concise, honest, raw. Mm depictions of this entire group and it's beginning to its end and uh and it, it, it it's just before glenn fry died so oh, wow. he has a lot of his uh comments on there so it's and it's told like they interview them in current time talking about mm. the whole situation it's fantastic i mean it, it's so weird with people like i think the knock on them is like they're pretending to be one thing but they're really another yeah, thing yeah, yeah, and yeah. i'm like they are what they are. They're yeah. the Eagles. Yes. Are some of the songs soft? Yeah. Yeah. So what? You know, but the lyrics but, are still incredible. Well, and Hotel California and Life Fuck in the yeah. Fast Lane. You and, can't touch Hotel California. No, those are great. Those are great songs. I think it's jealousy. But the fact that this guy hated the Eagles got them the the, the yeah. Stones track for fairly cheap. Um, and as he's driving off with the cab driver listening to Eagles, we have Bunny listening to Viva Las Vegas <laughs> driving in her like Jag convertible mm -hmm. and the camera goes down to her feet. And what do we see there? All toes. 10 beautiful toes. Yep. Uh, 
Back home, his apartment has been tossed. Of course, he trips over that board he nailed into yep. the floor, naturally. And there are some bare feet standing right there, and it's Maud. Jeffrey. Maud? Love me. Uh, that's my robe. <laughs> Cut to after. Yeah. Uh, of course, he lights a joint. <laughs> she asks, what do you do for recreation? He's like, you know, usual things. Bowl, drive around, occasional acid flashback. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they talk more about the very complicated case. And uh, and now we find out a little more that not only did he embezzle the money, did the big Lebowski embezzle the money from the foundation, yeah. but he's not really rich. No. He's on an allowance. And I love this because this was the guy who was given Lebowski shit mm -hmm. for not working. Right. This is this is where the clear like anti-elitism is yep. in, in this film, without a question. Um, and, you know, I mean, you we've talked about it before. There's nothing that irritates me more than entitlement and people believing that they are deserving of something just because of some sense of social status. Yeah. Uh, drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and then she's doing an interesting yoga position. Yeah. You know, kind of got her chest up to her, her knees up to her chest. Mm. And he asks about it and she says, oh, I've been told that this is the best position for conception. <laughs> <laughs> Great spit take. <laughs> because the whole reason that she, what she wants is she wants a child. Yeah. Not a father. Right. Because he says, I, I can't have you having a, I can't be, and she's like, you're not going to be part of the process. And then he's like, oh, okay, I'm cool. I'm cool. Um, and of course, he's also still thinking about this thing with dad yeah. and the money. And he's like, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. What? Oh, man, my thinking about this case has become very uptight. Yeah. <laughs> uptight. I love that. And this is where the dude is putting it together. If he knows I'm a fuck up, why would he put me in charge? Exactly. He doesn't want her back. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a shit about the million bucks in the briefcase because there was no money in the briefcase. Yep. He sent out a ringer and we sent out a ringer. There was nothing but ringers because yep. he stole the money. Here's the thing about this. I don't think the plot is important to this movie at all. Okay. I mean, it's just because you're, I mean, yes, you're kind of following it. But right. what it really is about is all these experiences of the dude. Right. You know, it's just the plot is kind of the mechanism that you're hanging all this other stuff on. Yes. Because we don't care about catching the bad guy. Mm -hmm. In fact, we abandon all of them. Well, it's not that I don't know if I would say we don't care because the dude has to survive this. Yes, agreed. So, so in the way that we care, we care that we want the dude to survive this. That's how. That's as much as we care. We don't necessarily want the person to pay or or get justice or whatever, you know? Right. That we just want the dude to survive this whole situation. Well, and we enjoy watching him go through oh, absolutely. whatever this thing is. Absolutely. We get to uh, Lebowski's house. We see the Jag wrecked. Mm -hmm. Inside, Brad is picking up clothes. Bunny is doing some dance naked yeah. in the background. Yeah. Um, and and Brad warns him, don't go in there. You know, the big Lebowski's really angry. Um, so they, they finally go in and find Big Lebowski in his wheelchair. And they're asking him, where's the money? I thought yeah. they call him a human paraquat. <laughs> um, and they're like, oh, you're a phony millionaire, pretending you're a millionaire. And Walter's like, that's not the only thing he's phony about. I've seen a lot of spinals, dude, and this guy's a fake. <laughs> so Walter pulls him up out of the oh, wheelchair, throws God. him on the ground. And the dog, the fact that the dog has gone with him and the dog is barking and like licking his face and, uh, and Lebowski is weeping. Yeah. <laughs> um, the big Lebowski is weeping. Yeah. The big Lebowski is weeping. Yeah. It's like, come on, help me put him back in his chair. And, and so we've, this is kind of the end of the mystery. Mm -hmm. We, we don't really resolve anything because yeah. we leave, we know that he embezzled the money. Bunny is back. We know whose toe was taken mm -hmm. and we kind of go, okay. And where do we end up again? Bowling. Yep. And we think it's over. Yeah, you can, you you're not wrong for thinking that it's over. Well, because that was the plot. Yep, we which, which is kind of resolved, and Donnie is bowling, and he had been throwing rocks through this whole movie. Mm -hmm. This time, one pin left standing. Yep, this is very symbolic. It's a uh, foreshadowing. Yeah, and then we get the Jesus again. What's this day of rest shit? What's this bullshit? I don't fucking care. It don't matter to Jesus. But you're not fooling me, man. You might fool a fox in the league office, but you don't fool Jesus. It's Bush League psycho stuff. Laughable, man. <laughs> I would have fucked you in the ass Saturday. I'll fuck you in the ass the next Wednesday instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, a perfectly fantastic monologue yep. from Totoro. Um, we're walking out of the bowl bowling alley, and there are the Nihilists. Ah, sons of bitches. And they want the money or they're going to kill the girl. And like, no, they're, they're, 
The girl's already back. Yeah, yeah. You don't have a hostage. Without a hostage, there is no ransom. That's what ransom is. Those are the fucking rules. To the nihilists are like going, well, that's not fair. Yeah. Not fair. I thought you were nihilists. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the nihilist here? And the nihilists are like, basically, they just go to, well, we're going to rob you now. Right. And one of them has a sword. Yeah. It's insane. And and Donnie's getting nervous. Are these men going to hurt us? Right. And, and Goodman's response is, no, Donnie, these men are cowards. Um, and the dude and Donnie just start pulling out their wallets. Right. That's not what Walter's going to do. The, the, the nihilists say, we takes the money. And Walter says, come and get it. And man, guy draws the sword. Walter throws that bowling ball oh. into a dude's chest. God, it's incredible. That, I think it's Flea. He throws it into Flea's chest. It Flea? I think it is. Yeah, I think it's Flea's. Flea's. Oh! Oh! Yeah. yeah, he's just done. And, and, and then he's in a fight, and he does get stabbed, by the way, yes. by the sword. It doesn't. You don't see it very well. No. And then he's biting a guy's ear. He kicks the shit out of these guys, man. That's where, that's where going back to that earlier scene where we go, well, Walter's an idiot. Yeah. Now I go like, man, he wipes them out. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and he just destroys all three of them, and then they turn around, and Donnie's on the ground. Yeah, and a heart attack. Yeah, fucking Donnie, man. Yeah, it was fine. Buscemi says this is his favorite screen death ever. Oh, really? And he's had a lot. It's a gr it's a very sweet. Screen I mean, he's death. had the wood chipper. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, Miller's Crossing. I think he dies. That's the, true. Yeah, but it's a very sweet screen death. Very much. Um, we're at a funeral home. <laughs> this seems so funny because they they want to do right by Donnie. Yeah, but they don't have the money to do right <laughs> by the money, Donnie. man. It's 180 bucks for that urn, and they're like, "Can't we rent the urn?" And they're trying to be cool about it. <laughs> they're trying to be as cheap as possible, yeah. but respectful as well. <laughs> Finally, it's like, let's go to Ralph's. Yeah, and we cut to them with a Folgers can out on the bluffs of some over Malibu or something <laughs> like that, and a beautiful, beautiful shot. And um, Walter gives his eulogy. Donnie was a good bowler and a good man. He was, he was one of us. He was a man who loved the outdoors and bowling. And as a surfer, he explored the beaches of Southern California from La Jolla to Leo Carrillo and up to Pismo. This is like a master class in acting yeah. from him because it's the layers of, I don't know what to say. Right. I'm trying to say something that sounds like a eulogy. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how to do that. Right. I actually am filled with emotions that I'm trying. He's doing all these levels. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's just, it's just perfect. And then, but then he gets kind of lost. Yeah. Because he gets lost, he goes into his old thing. The Vietnam thing. Yeah. Goes back to Vietnam. He died as so many young men of his generation before his time. At Kaysan, at Landoc, at Hill 364. And and the dude the dude's reaction to that is just so funny. And then they open up the can. Oh god. And pour out the ashes and the wind is coming off the ocean. Oh man. And covers the dude with these ashes. And again, it's the deadpan. Yeah. It's the it's the non-reaction reaction mm -hmm. to literally being covered with the ashes <laughs> of your dead friend. <laughs> um Walter man. <laughs> dude, I'm sorry. Oh shit, dude, I'm sorry. Goddamn wind. Fuck. God damn it, Walter. You fucking asshole. Dude, I'm sorry. It's a fucking travesty with you, man. Dude, I'm sorry. It was an accident. What was, a, what was that shit about Vietnam? Dude, I'm sorry. What the fuck does anything have to do with Vietnam? Dude, I'm what sorry. What the fuck are you talking about? Dude, I'm sorry. And he's so sad. I mean, Walter is really ju yeah. well, he just was nothing but abusive to Donnie throughout yeah. the whole movie. He is genuinely, genuinely sad. And they have this awkward hug. Yeah. Dude goes, fuck Walter. And then this is what I heard John Goodman's favorite line of all time. Hey, fuck it, man. Let's go bowling. Well, and also, this lets you know, this lets you into a window of Walter in that. Even when a guy he beat up all the time verbally and what and you know like kind of denigrated or whatever, he was still a man in his platoon in essence. Yeah, and absolutely. So when that man dies, you've lost a member of your own platoon, and so he immediately defaults into this place yep. where he's trying to do this eulogy or whatever, and of course brings it back to Nam because that's the last great thing he's ever done in his life. Right, it's very clear. I don't know, hitting that guy in the chest with a bowling ball is well, pretty awesome. Well, sure, sure. Um, we're back at the bowling alley, and the dude is kind of thinking. He's thinking about this. Sometimes you get the bar, and <laughs> who does he run into? But yep. Hey, man. How do you do, dude? 
the I, it, to me, I think Sam Elliott is like a mystical figure in this. He's movie. like a Deus Ex Machina, like yeah. he just shows up and shows yeah. in and out. Yeah. Um, and they they kind of have a conversation. Well, take care, man. Got to get back. Sure. Take it easy, dude. Oh yeah. I know that you will. Yeah. Well, the dude abides. <laughs> um, and and you know he's now he's talking to us. I don't know about you, but I take comfort in that. It's good knowing he's out there, the dude, taking her easy for all us sinners. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> and then just, well, that about does her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then in the background, what I love is after he does this whole monologue, Sam Elliott towards camera, is that in the background, dude bowls a strike. Yep. And I just have to say... That's hard. I mean, like, I'm sure they got a professional bowler, sure. but like, still, like, Sam Elliott's going to do a whole thing. And yeah. if you don't get that strike, <laughs> we're going to have to do another take. Uh, and we've reached the end of The Big Lebowski. Yep. Uh, we should talk. I mean, I think we kind of already said what the reception was. It came out. Yeah. It didn't lose money. It was mixed. It was got mixed reviews. Mm -hmm. It did okay. Yeah. And then slowly but surely, people started watching it. And it became this thing that played at midnight screenings and cult classics and with DVD went out. And then we get to Lebowski Fest. Yeah. You know, we're all over the world. There are these meetings of people who love this movie and yeah. and and celebrate it. it. I think in a way, I don't even think this is comparable to anything else. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, like, certainly there's Rocky Horror where people show up for midnight shows. Sure, sure, sure. There's... Um, or The Room. Yeah, or The Room or Monty Python. But I think Lebowski is like a unique one. Yeah. I, I guess they're all... You know what? I should say, all of those are different. Sure, but they don't do fests. Yeah. They don't do Monty, they don't, they don't do Monty Python the Holy Girl fests all over the Not world. Not that I know of. I mean, maybe no. they do. No, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And Lebowski, they do, for whatever reason. And I think the bowling thing is an aspect. It was very American bowling. Yeah. And so there's that there's that uh, kind of foundation for it as well, which I find has uh, a great and Labelle and uh, sorry Jeff Bridges has shown up to some of these. Oh yeah, and he's jammed out because he he plays yeah. you know and he's like worn his clothes, that kind of stuff. So, and he's done Q and A. So he and he speaks about it very fondly. That's the thing oh, yeah. that's great about it too, Steve. Is that sometimes you do a role and people are like, oh, I don't want to be identified with that role and blah blah blah. And then there are other guys like Jeff Bridges who like appreciate and respect this role because they've worked in other things as well and they give it love as much as they and goodman does too like you've mentioned right. many times well and bridges says that he loves this movie he says yeah. that if it comes on tv he sits and watches it, yeah. which is really unusual for actors because most yeah. of the time we don't want to watch this stuff. we fucking hate yeah. watching ourselves no it's hard it is um apparently the people that go to lebowski fest and there's one in london called the dude abides london <laughs> uh they call themselves achievers which i didn't know <laughs> which is funny there is a, a church uh called dudism Wow. Uh, it is the Church of the Latter-day Dude. <laughs> and I knew that this existed, but I, what I didn't know, there are 220,000 ordained priests wow. of Dudism. Wow. Yeah. All right. That is... And I, I, look, I get it. This is like the Zen master of today. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have final thoughts on The Big Lebowski? I mean, where would I even begin? I don't know. Here's what I could tell you, my final thoughts. It's a film that you can revisit and enjoy so many times. And it's not one of it's not like an Adam Sandler comedy or a, even uh, one of these other comedies that you might enjoy seeing over and over again. It's a different kind of comedy. It's a comedy that asks you to do a little more work mentally. It is like a private eye, obviously, like Steve mentioned numerous times. So that's the joy of it, too, is finding out who knows what, when, at what point... And how much do they know at what point that they're and how much are they manipulating the dude through the whole thing? So but really the reason to watch this is the acting is the acting from Jeff Bridges from John Goodman, seeing these great actors just kind of have this incredible chemistry and the dialogue. I mean, Joel and Ethan Cohen do such fantastic fantastic job with the writing in their films that creates this universe. You know, they also do a great job with like layering it with varying, being very uh, good at attention to detail in the worlds that they're creating, but it's the dialogue that creates the world and the interactions that these actors have. And through the whole thing, it's just incredible. And if you, and I think the best way to enjoy this film is altered in whatever you want to alter yourself. But if even without it, you can still thoroughly enjoy this film uh, and it's the unusual film, as Steve said, it's the unusual film that doesn't need the plot necessarily to be the reason for you to watch this movie. And that's really rare in a film. Uh, so Joel and Ethan Cohen deserve so much credit for creating a film that is incredibly unusual yet uh, horribly addictive. Agreed. 
It's funny. I, I, t- for my final thoughts, I want to go back to something that you said mm. at the beginning, which was this idea that you got some crap for for saying some movies you have to watch oh, more, yeah, more yeah, times yeah. to appreciate. Mm-hmm. And it's like the more I think about that, that is such a ridiculous thing. To, that is so obvious that that is true. Mm-hmm. And if you look at everything from Shakespeare to the Bible to all these things are things that that scholars have poured over over and over again and take years of analysis yeah. to figure out, like, to think about what this is going on. And you have whole schools of people arguing about the meaning of all this. And I think Lebowski is like that. I think Lebowski is a movie where every time you watch it, you can't actually appreciate everything at once. Mm-hmm. There is so much happening, and it is so brilliantly silly and surreal and bizarre and fun and watching all of these actors every single one of them from the the from jeff bridges on down yeah. like chew up their particular scene it's something you can't appreciate the first time right and i one other thought too which is i really think you know there's a year i think it's 93 where spielberg makes jurassic park and schindler's list in the same year yeah and you go oh my god like the guy that could do these two totally different amazing films right at the same time and the fact that they do fargo lebowski and oh brother right after each Mm -hmm. other is to me like what solidifies the cone brothers Mm -hmm. as oh my god these are among the great filmmakers of all time absolutely because they're so different and they're all so obviously cone brothers films Mm -hmm. And and each, I mean, they're just really powerful. Yeah. And I would watch any of those three right now. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I just spent a week studying Lebowski. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh. and for me, Steve, they culminated in, in No Country. That's the culmination oh, oh, yeah. of everything. And there is no like jokes in that movie yeah. it's very clear what that movie is and it's incredible absolutely mm-hmm. so that's what we think of the big lebowski i know you have a lot of thoughts about the big lebowski <laughs> everyone has please if you want to uh you can visit us and have join the conversation on our facebook page you can subscribe on itunes on youtube on stitcher and a whole bunch of other places you can leave comments and reviews they really help us we love seeing them big huge thank you to uh our patreon supporters who suggested this film mm-hmm. we really appreciate your support if you want to support us you can go to patreon.com slash the cinephiles. Maybe there's a movie you would like to hear us talk about. Uh, as I mentioned before, my great white shark film beyond the cage of fear is now finally available on Amazon prime. I would love you all to check it out and please leave a review for that. As always, you can reach me on Twitter at SR Morris. John, where can they reach you? You guys can always reach me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And yeah, if you want to go and donate to our Patreon, www.patreon.com backslash the cinephiles is that correct yes uh and of course we have a facebook group as well come find us there on facebook facebook rather and of course please keep watching me on collider doing reviews now doing a bunch of stuff a bunch of shows going to be on movie talk more all those kinds of things it's going to be fun i appreciate all your comments there and of course the top 10 show on the sk plus uh uh network and uh outlaw nation as well so thanks everyone uh for listening to all of that and for listening to us here on the cinephiles i tell you it's such a fun fun time to be a break down these movies with you all and i hope you enjoyed us breaking down big lebowski absolutely and i think that's it for this week we will see you next time for another great film on the cinephiles <laughs>